and sit on down, take a seat. All right. Because guess what? I didn't get any sleep last night. So there will be, um, this today is going to be, we're running things by the books. Let's go. It's very special. <laughs> There's a song about that, but I'm not going to sing it. All right. Good morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, May the 26th. This is your Multnomah County Board of Commissioners, and we are very happy to be with you this morning. Um, we are actually not having our regular board meeting this morning. We are all budget all the time. And today is budget work session number nine. Today's meeting is also a hybrid board meeting, which means that some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those who are presenting virtually, that means you, Don. <laughs> You look great, I'm just teasing. <clears throat> Please remember to mute your mic when you're not speaking and before you present, check to make sure that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. All right, our first in-person Multnomah County budget hearing number nine is the library district, come on down. I think it's sort of, is this on? Yes, yeah. ominous that Don, this is his last his last day is Friday, but he's like up there in the, like some virtual ether or something like that. And wait till he talks. Yeah, <laughs> big booming voice. <laughs> um, good morning, Chair Kafori, Commissioners. Nice to see you all this morning. I am Bailey Elke, Director of Libraries for Multnomah County. I have with me in person, Sonia Irvin, who is our Equity Manager. And up there in the ether, Don Algeyer, our Director of Operations and Budget uh, Manager. So. Um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and kick it off. Uh, this is the next slide, please. Sorry. A, a quick agenda. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be one of those people who reads every slide to you, except for, for potentially one. Um, but we'll cover everything that um, that you see here on this agenda uh, in detail, and of course, ask questions as you wish. Next slide, please. These are our priorities, just a heads up that we're in the process of updating these. They won't be significantly different because unfortunately the world hasn't changed all that much uh, since the last time we took a look at these, but um, they are, as you can see, really focused on helping people um, uh, through what has been a really especially challenging time, a continued focus on uh, digital equity um, and a good continued focus on um, equity and diversity and how that's reflected in our staffing in our programming and services and the like. Um, and also, of course, uh, safety and healthy spaces for our staff and our patrons. Next slide, please. So we have them to join me. We have with us um, two members of our library advisory board. I think, as you are aware, our library advisory board every year creates a subcommittee that serves as our CBAC, the finance committee. Um, I just want to say uh, how grateful I am for the time and energy that those people put into this effort. They are the ones on the library advisory board who I think end up putting way in way more time than um, probably signed up for, frankly. <laughs> so um, I have with us today Claire Wilkinson and Aaron Cooper. They are, they constitute the CBAC this year. And um, as always, they've been curious. They've been um, really uh, forthright in their questions to us. And I think I will simply turn it over to them at this point. I'm just gonna start. Aaron, great, thanks, Aaron. Um, so yeah, our CBAC is a little bit different. Next than... slide, please, I'm sorry, sorry, oh. Aaron. Um, yeah, our CBAC is a little bit different than some of the other CBACs in that we meet year round um, and work closely with library staff and administration. So we're very. Would you mind stating your name for the record? Oh, I'm Erin Cooper. <laughs> and um, so we're really pleased to recommend this budget in its entirety. Um, we feel like it continues to serve the needs of the community. It incorporates flexibility. We have a heightened awareness of how important. Um, it is to be responsive to the changing needs of the community, and this budget reflects that. We also strongly approve of the continued use of the equity lens on all the program offers and really all aspects of managing the library. And um, we expect that to continue. 
also um, with staffing and administration to make sure that the people who are working at the library uh, continue to reflect the diversity that's in the community, even with hiring challenges that we're seeing now. So we expect that to continue. Claire. I'm with Claire Wilkinson. We just have uh, three other points that we'd like to pull out, particularly um, from our CBAC letter. Um, we're very aware that in previous years, the library has maintained a financial... I'm sorry, Claire, would you state your name for the record as well? Claire Wilkinson. Sorry. <laughs> um, so in previous years, the library has maintained financial reserves, and we suggest a strategic plan is developed for using those to reflect the capital needs that are going to evolve as the capital plans develop. And we are also conscious that we pay quite a high internal service rate, and that has risen over the past five years. And as our physical footprint is increasing, which is very exciting, um, we're conscious that the internal service rate is going to consume an even larger amount of the library budget. And so we would like to suggest that that um, internal service rate is reviewed. Erin? All right. Uh, so our last point is, as I alluded to before, our CBAC operates differently than some of the other CBACs in that uh, we meet year-round. We have a real in-depth knowledge of the library, um, how it functions, how we serve the community, and with the library system goals. And also the, the funding system for the library is a little bit different. Having the district um, allows for a different sort of um, long-term planning that isn't always present or isn't always available to other departments. And so for a long time, representatives from our CBAC to the central CBAC have felt that um, we often don't have a lot to contribute to the central CBAC because our concerns and questions and challenges are really different than what the CBACs for other departments are facing. So I do think that in the upcoming year, the um, required involvement of the library CBAC in the central CBAC process should be reviewed um that would have to change in the charter so i think that that's something that's worth looking into without a desire to weaken this process by any means um i i think there's a strong desire for our for the library CBAC to continue operating in the way that we do um but it's very different from other departments so yep that's what we have thank you claire thank you yeah thank you both and thank yeah. you both for coming this morning Thank you thanks for your work and thanks to your entire team. Thanks. So Sonia now is going to speak to our, our equity and uh, diversity commitment. So good morning. Thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Sonia Irvin. Again, uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the equity and inclusion manager for the library. Uh, first, I want to say I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing at the library um, around equity and inclusion for a number of years now. Um, in terms of the budget process and how we've looked at equity, we've been doing that for a number of years where we have met with um, the managers and folks that are, are developing the, the program offers to ensure that they understand the importance of having goals around equity. Uh, for this year, Don and I met with each group and part of that discussion was ensuring that folks understood um, how to use an equity lens, how to look at their, their offers through an equity lens. They developed their offers. I reviewed them. Um, we talked through things that maybe there were revisions on to create uh, more inclusive program offers, program offers that really provided uh, more around serving those with the greatest barriers. And um, so uh, the thing about creating goals and equity and, and some of what we, we were looking at doing with the budget, it's not just like creating one goal or putting in a few goals, we really have been looking at how do we infuse equity across the entire organization and how do we as a library not just say we're going to do this one goal or this one transactional thing, that it really is the foundation for everything that we're doing. So in the budget, we look at the, we, we've really looked at that, like how do we create a budget that really supports and that really reallocates resources to serve communities most in need, um, to really focus on bodies of culture and linguistically diverse communities. So. Um, so the budget process is, has been for several years, and I think particularly this year we've also um, gone deeper. And I think that our our staff, our managers, really understand the importance of making sure that equity is at the center of what what we're doing and how we're we're looking at our budget and our services. Um, so some of the goals that just a, a couple of the goals that, that we pulled out were we are looking at having a, um, a teen librarian focusing on uh, houseless youth. 
we know that downtown and it's going to be at central so we know that downtown in that core area there's a number of services um there's a lot of a lot of young folks that are unhoused and services for folks that are unhoused young folks so we'll be uh looking at that and and having that position our community information efforts um, we're expanding our access to our phone services so we're adding language ksas to our contact center so that we can reach more folks and we don't have to go through interpretation quite as much um, because that certainly helps to build the connection and build the relationship. Our integrated library services, we'll be doing an equity and inclusion assessment on our collection. We wanna make sure that our collection as closely as possible um, resembles the, the communities that we serve, that our collections uh, support our community and our We Speak Your Language uh, uh, services that we have. And then we're doing a data equity evaluation. Um, and so we, we're looking at how do we collect our data? What data are we collecting? And are we doing that in a way that really tells the story for the communities we're looking to serve? Uh, so we are, we are really looking at shifting it to a data justice approach of looking at stories, looking at hearing people's stories because we know that those stories are, have rich data in them. Um, and then how do we take those stories and really tell tell the story of what we're doing, what the community needs, and how we're building that based on community needs. And if I may interject just, just briefly, we're really excited about this project. I just want to sort of put an asterisk on it, and we'll be sharing more out about this. It's, it's pretty novel, and it's something that a lot of our peer libraries around the country are really excited to, be, to see happening and are hoping to learn from us. And we're doing that in partnership with the Coalition for Communities of Color. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening. These are just a few. Um, and again, it's, it's really the work that's happening across, across the library um, in all of our departments. Next slide, please. All right, so our workforce equity. Um, first, I want to say I'm really excited. We have been able to hire uh, equity analysts. So there are now two of us. So the work that we've been doing, we get to continue to push forward and, and push even harder on. So I'm very excited about that. Um, uh, so some of the things that we're doing, and these are just a couple of, of activities um, that are happening. So we have a leadership, MCL leadership development program for our new managers. Um, so helping managers support a cohort that goes through and meets every month and helping support them to be successful as managers. And part of that process is uh, that I work with them to really understand and gain information and sort of deepen their awareness of equity and inclusion um, and cross-cultural awareness in supervision and in, eva in evaluation. So we know that we, we are very often functioning in a dominant culture box in terms of supervision and evaluation and how we, how we uh, work together and how supervisors manage folks. So really working with them to understand how to expand that box, right? So not everybody's gonna fit in that dominant culture box. So how do managers work to expand that box and understand cultural differences in order to be able to provide the best support for staff who, who don't fit into the, those, those areas um, that maybe we expect them to. So that's one of them. Um, I meet with all of the managers Every other month at minimum, we have scheduled meetings. So I work directly with the managers and administrators to support them in their own equity journey and their own awareness, but also in what they're doing at their locations, what they're doing within their programs. Um, obviously, I meet with folks in between if necessary, but those are standing meetings so that we can specifically spend time to help, um, help managers really understand uh, where they are and how um, how their being in the world impacts the, the folks we serve and, and the, the staff that they're, they're uh, supporting. And then in addition with those meetings, meeting with managers of color, we've had a, a, a it's wonderful, we've had more managers of color brought on um, and move up. And so part of those meetings too is supporting our managers of color and really understanding their, their additional burdens for managers of color uh, working in dominant culture. And then we developed a recruitment and hiring manual that's specifically focused on equity and inclusion. It's a manual that uh, takes folks from the beginning of the recruitment process all the way through the interview process and has a very, very specific focus on how to understand bias in yourself, what to look for in candidates, how to develop panels, how to set up rooms for interviews so that it creates the most welcoming environment. So it's a manual that just sort of covers everything. Uh, so we've certainly seen uh, that this work is, is supporting increasing our, our workforce, our diversity in our workforce. So our staff of color make up nearly two thirds of our regular workforce under the age of 35. 
Um, and staff of color make up more than half, 54 percent of, of the regular workforce who have been at MCL for uh, Multnomah County Library for less than five years. So we're seeing this, this just really amazing increase in bringing in uh, diversity blessings. Um, diversity into the organization, our managers of color, we now are at 32 percent. Um, so I think we're at around 22, 23. Um, when I started five years ago, I think we had three. So it's it's really exciting that we were seeing this this work um, play out and show results. And in this next year, I think because for me, you know, diversity is is not a focus because you can have a diverse workforce and they, people can be really unhappy and not feel welcome and included. So really, the next push, especially with having a a second person on is going to be how do we ensure that we're supporting our, our folks of color um, in retention. So, so we've gotten into, we've gotten the diversity moving forward and now the focus really is going to be retention uh, and, and making sure people feel supported. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah, I want to, I want to just call this out because I think this is. The numbers, of course, are wonderful. Um, knowing that there's people behind those numbers are really important and also giving you a lot of kudos because this did not happen by accident right and as we talk about it's intentional and i i just i know that so much of of credit goes to you and I really appreciate you and mm, thank you thank you and we've been through some rough times so i especially want to thank you for sticking around <laughs> <laughs> speaking of retention <laughs> i i this i love doing the work at the library it really i mean it, it has been um, it's not easy work at all, um, and I, I think our management family has always been hugely supportive. Um, and I've seen our our managers, our staff are now. I don't have to be in all the meetings, right? And people are like, "Well, let's look at this through an equity lens." You know, who does this impact? So it, it's just been wonderful to see the transformation, and there's been so much support by the executive team. Um, so yeah, I love doing the work here. We love to have you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Kafari. Uh, so I think Don is up next. Good morning, Chair and Board. My name is Don Allgaier, Director of Operations for the Library. And what you have here is an organizational chart for the library. Um, it's a there are going to be a couple of organizational charts that break things down into uh, more uh, of the parts within these divisions because our overall organizational chart, as you can see, is very simple right now. We have two divisions going into fiscal year 2023. One of them, Department Administration, um, which includes a large number of programs that support library services. It's about 62 FTE and about $22.8 million. And then the Public Services, which is the large majority of the uh, budget, which is focused on services, direct services to the public. Uh, that's a $76.5 million uh, budget with over 480 FTE involved. Next slide. Here you can see the budget uh, uh, according to uh, last year's adopted budget and then this next year's proposed budget. There is a 3.2% increase over the adopted budget. Uh, and that uh, takes the proposed budget to $99.6 million for the next year. This includes um, ARP funding in both the adopted budget last year and the proposed budget this year. Next slide. Here we have the uh, five-year trend for the library's full-time equivalencies. So the uh, uh, equivalent number of full-time positions you can see uh, that it's about the same um, FTE that we're looking at for next year as we had in fiscal year 2019. And you can see from fiscal year 2019, a slight dip going into fiscal year 2020. Uh, during that year, that was when we were having 1% constraints on our spending to be able to try and maintain the balance into out years for the district and uh, during that year in particular we had a number of vacancies that had been in the organization for a while that hadn't been filled that we were able to uh, eliminate um, and with the 
again, were vacant and had been vacant for quite some time. And then you see that we're pretty consistent from uh, fiscal year 2020 through 2022. And then this year you're seeing an increase in the FTE uh, to 543.25, which includes um, largely a, an increase for um, safety and security staff that we'll talk about in a little bit. Next slide. The budget by category, uh, again, $99.6 million, including the ARP funding. And this is very similar to what you see every year. Uh, two thirds of the budget ends up uh, being personnel. About a fifth of the budget, though an increasing amount um, each year is internal service costs for the library. That includes our services for IT and facilities. Um, then you have uh, books and materials, which are always right around 9% of the budget. And uh, then supplies and materials at 3.7%. That, that amount has decreased over probably the last five years. And then a contractual amount, uh, just a little less than 2%. Next slide. We're going to talk about the proposed budget now by division. Next slide. And you can see here um, again, just another representation of how the budget breaks out by uh, division. Next slide. So that's me, Department Administration, which is, uh, uh, as you already heard from Don, accounts for about 62. Um, FTE, it includes, as you can see, the director's office, our business services office, which is what Don oversees, facilities, uh, also Don, he's done for three days. Um, the bond administration, but that money is all, uh, comes from the bond, but those FTE sit in the library's budget. IT, human resources, marketing and, and communications. This is, we have consolidated um, some other divisions, uh, but the the four percent growth is pretty in line, and this this divi division is pretty in line with inflation. That's it about that. And next slide, please. Some of the work that happens in department administration is such a vague term, so just quickly to share some of the things that um, that overall division is responsible for. Obviously, all the things I just listed. Also, the library, more specifically, the library's website. All of our marketing and communications, and I just want to give a shout out to that group of people. That team has not only grown, but has become incredibly uh, smart and creative and inclusive. We have several staff there who reflect um, BIPOC communities and speak languages other than English, which has really enriched our um, communication with the, the community. Um, I'm super excited about their work. Obviously, Sonia's uh, department related to equity and inclusion and um, the other the other pieces that I mentioned earlier. So a lot happens in that department, but it's um, it's all really important to the operations of the library. Next slide. So this the, the Department of Information year over year, as I mentioned earlier, there's about a four percent increase. Um, it's partly about consolidation of other programs that have been folded into the Department of Administration, um, but nothing significant in terms of year over year or this division. Next slide, please. I think we're back to Don. Hello. So this slide demonstrates the library uh, user satisfaction through a net promoter score. And the net promoter score is a way of measuring uh, whether people would recommend the service that they're using, in this case, the library. It's used in private industry quite a bit, and more and more you see it used here and there with, uh, with public uh, agencies. Uh, looking at um, zero, uh, anything above zero is considered a positive score. It can go up to 100. Generally speaking, um, in really good years uh, for, industry leaders in terms of uh, brand recognition and loyalty you're talking usually uh, in the private industry it's uh, 75 is considered quite good and you can see that the library consistently trends well above that uh, you can see in this trend line a dip 
in 2020. That is not surprising, given that the library closed its doors during the pandemic. And then as we move uh, out of closure, you can see that increase in uh, the response of the public to the library's uh, services again. And so we're we're really proud of keeping that really high level of uh, of loyalty amongst the people using the library, and um, and it's one way in which we are able to sort of track that user's satisfaction along with you know many many other ways of engaging with people. Next slide. I think I could have told you that just by the emails that I'm receiving. <laughs> <laughs> We're so happy the doors are open. Um, yeah, I think no one ever ex obviously expected the doors to close, and it was quite a quite a um, dramatic first change. time in our history, correct? Yep, exactly. Yep. Um, so uh, I, we wanted to include a little bit about what's going on with the bond, although I think you've already seen DCA's budget, and the vast majority of those expenditures and resources are found in in that budget. Um, but you know, one of the things that I really wanted to highlight in terms of the library's engagement around this effort, which is, as you know, huge, <laughs> is our commitment, which we said early on would be a priority for us is engaging the community in how these new spaces are designed, what they look like, how they reflect the community. And just super quick highlights of some of that work, which has been really um, substantive. And I think you've heard some of this in presentations we've done specifically about the bond work. But you know, we, we've done a really great job of engaging youth in these projects and in ways that acknowledge the value of their contributions. They're compensated. Not only do they provide um, input from their perspectives on how they want these spaces to reflect their needs and their community's needs, but they also learn a lot. This is an opportunity for these youth to, you know, be sort of front and center in terms of what it means to design buildings, construction, all the considerations around these kinds of projects. So we're super excited about that. Um, we've had a, a survey, um, multiple surveys. We've had multiple community events where we've, you know, just gone out into the community and asked people about these spaces. Um, we just recently had uh, a vote for the Holgate uh, Library, what people want to see in terms of the interior. Uh, scheme, design scheme, that was super exciting. We got a lot of feedback and um, we're, I don't know if we've been up. <laughs> Which one won? You're just gonna have to wait and see, I guess. Um, but that was super exciting. It was a really nice way to directly engage the community in these buildings and also really say to folks, these are your libraries. These are your libraries. So, you know, tell us what you want. As you know, we've got, um, one, two, three, four. We've got many projects underway. Um, five actual buildings. The operations center is furthest along. We're super excited about that. We hope to be getting um, construction underway uh, just it, next month. Uh, no, two months from now. Um, but all of those projects are moving along um, as expected, and we're really excited about that. So, uh, with that, I think I'll turn it back to Don. All right, thank you, Bailey. Next slide. The next division is the public services division, and this org chart breaks down a little more how um, the public services operates. We have three sort of categories um, in which the budget is organized. We have the location services, which includes all of the public location buildings and the services there, uh, and that is the largest uh, grouping. It's $46.5 million, um, well over half of the public services budget and uh, three quarters of the staffing with 344.5 FTE. We have community services, which includes our services in congregate settings, our outreach services, um, our new community engagement group, uh, the a lot of the work that happens to support uh, youth engagement and development in the community all happens within community services. That's $11.6 million and 75.5 FTE. 
And then you have integrated library services, which includes all of the services around our materials. So the processing um, and the sorting and the cataloging of our library materials, including all of our uh, digital materials and the work that happens around that. Uh, and then up in the corner, you can see not as one part of these, uh, these three groupings is public services management program offer, and that's where the uh, management for the um, this group sits along with our security uh, uh, administration and the office of project management and evaluation, and that is led by the deputy director. Uh, it's 3.4 million dollars in 19 FTE currently. Next slide. This uh, talks a little bit more about the various uh, uh, activities that happen in public services uh, beyond the 19 public service locations. You have uh, materials selection that is happening. You have virtual and telephone services um, that are combined at, uh, within a work group to help support uh, a consistent experience for the patrons. And then you have uh, as well, materials movement, programming, uh, the book budget, and uh, project management and evaluation. Next slide. In public services, one of the areas we've uh, really focused in on is culturally responsive positions over the last five years. Uh, you've heard some statistics around some of this already. But we wanted to focus in on specific uh, KSA positions that are budgeted for this next year for this slide. Uh, and this is the increase over time in the number of budgeted language and cultural positions system wide. You can see um, we were sitting at about 108 in fiscal year 2020. You see some increases, which I think has been kind of our our progress even in the years before 2020, you see sort of incremental changes like this. And then with the large number of uh, recruitments that have gone on in this last year, we've seen a significant jump in terms of the number of uh, budgeted language and um, cultural KSA positions to about 150, 154, I guess it says. And so uh, that's about a quarter of our, um, of our staff, just to put that in perspective. We're really proud of that growth in this next year. We expect that to be um, really reflected over time in terms of our continued ability to uh, create more um, engaging offerings, both in terms of uh, the services within our buildings and as well as with outreach into the community. Next slide. Talking a little bit about what public services does, because it does so much. Uh, we look at the um, services that we are have been restoring through this year, knowing that we're also going to be continuing to um, build going into this next year. We have 17,000 plus books distributed to child care providers. 124,000 uh, email, phone, chat, and text contacts answered by our community information staff. We still have really high participation in summer reading. Um, the last uh, full data at 95,646 children and teens. The we have programs focused on community interest and in learning um, to make sure that as we build back our uh, programs in our buildings, we're able to have th have events that are relevant to the public. We have deliveries to homebound library patrons, so we're always trying to make sure that we're able to reach those people that are not able to reach the library on their own. We have uh, library services in juvenile and adult detention centers. We've had a lot of uh, growth and the program for the juvenile detention center. Uh, it's been really uh, inspiring to see the work that is happening there and the um, connections that are being created. 
We have one-on-one -on -one book a librarian appointments that are meant to provide the services that we have always served, uh, provided in libraries, but provide them in a way that meets people where they're at and when they need those services, as opposed to uh, what is convenient for the library. Virtual tutoring and school supports continue to be uh, provided through the library and public computer and technology support is of course something we're, we're well known for. The Library Connect program it has uh, turned school IDs into library card accounts, which has increased the number of teens and to have access to the library by default. And uh, in fiscal year 21, the last year we have full year data for, the library had over 52,000 new library card registrations. So we're continuing to see that there is new uh, there are new members and new um, interest in getting library services, which is always a good sign. Next slide. In the public services budget, you can see it's about a $2.5 million increase from the adopted budget. Um, the proposed budget, I always feel like I must note, does not include the foundation amendment, which will include additional FTE, 1.5 FTE and um, additional funding for uh, services. This uh, now includes the project management and evaluation uh, group, as well as uh, materials movement is now a part of public services. So we had a few uh, programs from the operations division uh, that is no longer in place this year, next year, that are now in public services. Next slide. The fiscal year 2023 proposed budget summary and impacts and the new library program funding. So uh, as you have heard through the uh, forecast, uh, we have had a slight addition in terms of revenue due to the um, uh, changes with urban renewal areas. Um, that gave us the ability to make some small uh, targeted additions within the budget. Uh, that includes three positions for the library, marketing and communications, a Spanish speaking communications coordinator that will help to support outreach uh, and uh, communications within uh, communities that speak Spanish. We will have the a contract specialist senior position that is uh, really critical for the library moving forward to be able to uh, deal with the volume of contracts that uh, we expect to be seeing, especially as we move uh, forward with the uh, bond construction work. I think there are going to be a number of things as we move into new buildings that we will need to be able to manage through on top of just a, what has been a growing workload for that that team. And then a central library library administrator, uh, the, and this position is largely uh, focused in on being able to provide support for the management team at central that helps to work through all of the uh, security and safety issues that are happening at central library. That team often time spends a good percentage of their day on the floor supporting patrons and staff and maintaining a safe environment. Uh, and this will help to make sure that they have additional resources to be able to do that. Next slide. Along with that, there were uh, significant library uh, fund reallocations during the year that have come before you uh, for approval. Uh, I just wanted to reflect that here. That included an increase of eight FTE in library safety liaisons to support public uh, locations that were approved throughout the year through reallocations. Some of that was from uh, shifts of resources from the uh, resources that went into the sheriff's department uh, staffing at Central uh, when that program went away and moved uh, towards a uh, contracting in the short term and then a longer term solution around library safety liaisons. The um, 
and then the remainder of that was uh, taken from funds set aside for that fiscal year. We knew we were reopening buildings, and as we presented in the previous budget, we knew that there were probably some things we wouldn't anticipate or that we might get wrong as we reopened the buildings. And I think one of the things that we've seen uh, pretty clearly during that time is the challenges that the public has had during uh, the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic and the resulting um, increase in uh, incidents within the libraries. And so uh, one of the ways in which we, we shifted during the course of the year was to increase uh, staff that are focused in on safety and security. It's going to be continued focus, as I think you all know, going into this next year. Um, but that was one way in which we were shifting during this last year. There were also a number of other changes that happened throughout the fiscal year that came before you. It uh, resulted in about a net decrease of 0.25 FTE. And that largely had to do with the um, shifting of staffing around reopening of library buildings, the reclassification of library clerk positions, uh, and the changes to public service management positions during the year. Next slide. We did not have any state or federal in impacts and we do not uh, use general funds to support operations. Next slide. So I think this is mine, right, Don? Uh, as you all are well aware, um, and as Don just referenced, um, issues around safety and security continue to be a challenge and also a priority for the library, which has been the case for several years now. Um, but this past year or so, those the incidents, both in terms of severity and frequency, are just increasing. Um, I think you also all know that that's not unique to the Multnomah County Library. It's it's very much true of every other large urban library system in the country, but also true of every public space and um, uh, uh, that in our community. I mean, there are other incidents, TriMet, for instance, the parks, all of those sorts of of of. Um, agencies and uh, we are not immune to that, unfortunately, but we continue to direct resources to trying to make those spaces as safe and secure as they can be um, without actually closing our doors to the public. So we have um, hired a safety and security trainer and that person's entire job is to focus on training related to safety and security for our employees. Um, much more intentional, much more focused, and we're, he's just getting underway, but is already, I think, proving really valuable in terms of how we think about um, our employees and how they can contribute to creating safer spaces. As Don mentioned, we've added um, eight FTE of library security liaisons. Those are um, represented employees. It's a model we instituted, oh gosh, maybe eight or so years ago <laughs> um, as we were shifting away from um, resources that we contracted with the sheriff's office for. Um, and we've also added some uh, management capacity at central and uh, coordinator positions, pick coordinator positions, just to have positions that are more directly focused on safety. And then um, we've, we are really taking the opportunity of the new library spaces and the refresh that's happening as a result of the bond work to think about the design of those spaces, the infrastructure, um, how what we can do, what we can bring to um, the more intentionally around how we think about safety and security and how those spaces are shaped. It's some great examples, things like sight lines. I think you've heard us talk about a lot of times, um, but also you know entryways. The access to those entryways, the bathrooms, you know, how we're able to monitor those spaces, um, staff locations where they are going to be set, creating more flexibility in terms of where staff will be and you know, so that they can better monitor those spaces. We've also, we're also in the process of hiring security consultants from the bond side of things to really look at as we design these new spaces and new buildings. How are we factoring in safety and security in terms of that design and construction? So I'm I'm really looking forward to that work. So as you can see, it's a it's a it's sort of a, a 
multifaceted approach to how we bring our resources to bear on what is a really challenging situation. Next slide, please. And back to Don. Thanks, Bailey. The uh, COVID-19 and American Rescue Plan update we had in fiscal year 2022, uh, we focused in on the funding for a library uh, vehicle that was purchased that will become the library tech mobile. Uh, it is being is going to be outfitted with technology and other accessories and the library aims to debut that tech mobile in some this summer. And we're very excited about that. I wish I had more pictures to share with you right now, uh, but soon enough. The, FY fiscal year 2023 ARP funding is focused in on outreach hotspots. Uh, that program expands public access to the technology kit lending program. We will have additional 500 hotspots that will enhance that uh, program. Uh, last year, we also received ARP uh, funding from the state to uh, support an outreach vehicle and uh, programming support for that. And so this will enhance that uh, that funding as well. Our <laughs> goal with that is really to get those kits into the community. We rely heavily on community partners to make sure that we're getting those kits to communities that are most in need of those resources. Uh, and um, And so far we've been really successful. We've seen lots of demand for that. We think that there's going to be continued demand for that in the year ahead. And so uh, this is a program that I think is going to make a really big difference in the year ahead in terms of making sure that folks have ex access, especially during the school year. So next slide. And here you can see just the breakdown of the, the funding from last year and the proposed funding for this next year, along with some uh, photos of what one of those kits looks like with the backpack uh, beneath there. Next slide. So um, I think all of you are aware that in the time that that I've been in this role, which is now unbelievably over 13 years, <laughs> Um, one of my priorities has been to really ensure that the library is evolving in a way that really reflects changes in the community and the world around us. The library as an institution has been around for a very long time um, and the world has changed dramatically uh, over the over just the last 20 years. I, you know, we have I, one of my talking points when we were talking about the bond was we hadn't changed our staffing model significantly or our spaces since um, before Google was invented. So, <laughs> I mean, obviously the world has changed. And, um, you know, I wanted to, our, our change management team really did a great job of capturing sort of what feels like just this relentless um, change that's happening within the library. Some of it, the result of things we have no control over, but, but some of it intentional and a lot of it driven largely by um, the bond work. Those new spaces are really a catalyst for implementing some of the ways in which we're hoping to reshape how we serve our communities and how we engage our communities in that reshaping. And we've created four buckets. And I just, I want to sort of, these do such a nice job of sort of covering all of that, but doing it in a way that is, you can conceive of, <laughs> rather than sort of a paint splatter approach. And those buckets are our, our collections, our spaces, our staffing, and our services. And um, Sonia mentioned earlier our efforts to really ensure that our collections are reflective of the diversity of our community and make sure that we have um, materials in our collections that are resonant for, for people who speak languages other than English, people who bring um, cultures and experiences other than dominant culture to um, the library. And that's been really exciting, but it also has meant really thinking differently about how we manage the, in particularly the physical collection. And you've heard us talk a lot about automated materials handling and the efficiencies we hope to get from that. In terms of our spaces, as I mentioned earlier, we're really hyper-focused and I think can demonstrate a commitment to centering community voices and what those spaces look like and um, how they reflect the community. We're really excited about that. Um, and we're also using this opportunity to think about 
um, how those spaces work better for our staff and um, are more welcoming for the people who are using those spaces. And then our staffing, as I mentioned, our staffing models haven't dramatically changed since before Google is invented and our services continue to evolve. So we're really looking at what's the service model and what is the staffing that makes the most sense, not just in those new spaces, but in a world that is really driven by forces different than when, you know, MCL started uh, over 150 years ago. I um, mean, we've been working in partnership with the union on that, and I think we've, we're making some really good progress there. And then, you know, in keeping with um, centering the community, our services are really meant to be services and programs that we think our community really needs, especially people in our community facing the greatest barriers. A lot of that has to do with programming, but a lot of it has to do with technology, and we're really committed to um, focusing access to the internet, focusing access to learning about technology on the folks in our community who most need that. So we call this taking shape, um, but it's, uh, it is a way of capturing everything that's underway at MCL, has been underway and will be continuing um, as we move forward. And with that, next slide, it's time for questions. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Myron, are you able to join us for questions? I am. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Um, wow. I just, you know, always love the library's presentations on pretty much every sorry for my voice. Um <clears throat> you this is this was really great. Um I want to thank Claire and Aaron and the CBAC team. Uh, I really, I really appreciated in their presentation um, talking about sort of that the deep engagement and connection with the department and that ongoing work year round. Um, I think that's a great model, and uh, and so just um, encourage and support and appreciate that. Um, Sonia just really loved everything that you had to say about expanding on the library's equity efforts and approach. And um, I just look forward to seeing um, to seeing that work uh, continue to expand and um, and hearing more about it. And I love um, I do love the program for youth experiencing houselessness and um, because where else but our libraries can we can we get get kids access that they need to support them um and uh, yeah dawn the status i really like how you the satisfaction survey and how you talked about getting feedback <clears throat> and i know it's sort of hard to measure outcomes and things in some of the the services that are provided and a, a satisfaction survey can be a great tool but um, you know it needs to be done done right, and it, it sounds like you've really done it right. And so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and I very much su support increasing internet and space capacity, and um, you know love to love to dive into a, a few things. Um, but I will send some of those in some follow up questions. Uh, and um, including about hotspots and stuff. And um, but otherwise, I just this was a, a really great presentation. Thank you to to all of you. And um, and uh, that, that's it. Thank you, Commissioner. Look Thank forward you. to your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, uh, everybody. Bailey, Sonia, Don. Um, I just sort of echo the fact I, I don't have any questions or maybe one one small one, but um, just echo the fact that it's a great chance to get a summary of all of the programs and the services that the library provides and the way that you're thinking about the future. That summer that summary slide really helped me. Good. You know, I think those buckets thinking yeah. about the work in those buckets is a really helpful way of, of framing it. Um, Sonia, very much appreciated the way that you talk about equity and the way that you're doing the work. Um, some of the numbers were were great and support that, but more than that, it was it was your description of how you and the team 
is infusing equity throughout the work and that it's not about a specific statistic, although those are useful and there were some good ones. And so those were those were great to see. I mean, one of the ones that I appreciated, it wasn't in your presentation, but in Don's was about the KSAs. Um, that is a substantial ramp up and it's such a critical part of how we infuse equity throughout our program. So I really appreciated that. Uh, appreciated the work that you're doing on safety and security. That's clearly a topic that's at the top of you know all of our minds, um, and it looks like a very thoughtful approach. Uh, I think the one it's sort of an ancillary question to the budget, but but you mentioned the foundation and that there will be an amendment coming up, and I'm curious what what is um, what's the connection between the foundation or what work is the foundation doing to support the capital project? Yeah, that is actually a really active conversation right now with the foundation. They're committed to supporting that work. Um, and we've had conversations, in fact, I think I have meetings scheduled again today. We're having regular meetings to talk about how to align their fundraising efforts with the needs of the capital um, bond work. And, you know, they have some sweet spots in terms of fundraising that uh, where they have really established good relationships and uh, an understanding of where they can sort of supplement the public funding that's already there for that bond work. And I expect that we'll see some some private uh, funds related in particular to early learning and early learning spaces, those sorts of things that are really critical and will always benefit from additional resources that we wouldn't necessarily do with with public funds. And then we're also exploring where where are other opportunities for private funding to really amplify how we sh how we shape those spaces to have the greatest effect. But it's really sort of a I wouldn't say nascent those conversations because they've been working pretty hard on what that's going to look like. But I think part of the challenge is, you know, we're still we've, we're so committed to the community engagement aspect of how those spaces are designed. So there's a timing issue in terms of the specificity they need to fundraise versus the effort we're putting into really gathering all that kind of feedback. So stay tuned and we'll definitely keep you updated on that. Commissioner. That's great. I appreciate that. And I, I can appreciate that there's a timing issue um, and, you know, obviously love the early learning piece and that's been a focus for the foundation for a long time. And it does seem with with this sort of we're moving into a new era of libraries, I would think that there would be lots of folks who'd be excited about some of the other pieces of the of the the work that you're doing. I would I would agree, Commissioner. I think there's some really wonderful opportunities. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Thanks so much, um, Bailey, for this and um, Don, thank you so much for all your work. It's just such a pleasure to have you um, here one last time to present this budget. And I just have appreciated your um, just your, I don't know, amazing work uh, for the library of keeping everything um, on track and um, planning for and implementing such huge growth in the library over the past several years. So thank you so much for this. Um, and uh, Sonia, thank you so much for all of the work. Your presentation was amazing. I was um, really, I mean, it was great to hear all this information, but especially for me, the real, the way that you really understand that where we are right now in terms of growing our, our um, diverse workforce is, is leaps and bounds where we used to be before. And yet now it has to be about retention and supporting managers and newly hired employees to make sure that they continue to feel welcome, supported, you know, at the library. So I just really appreciate this. And um, Claire and Aaron, it's really good to see you guys again. Thank you so much for all your work. Um, I take, I, I think that your point about the role of the library, you know, advisory board CBAC and, and where it does or doesn't need to connect with the central CBAC is something that I think we can pass along to the charter review committee since it's a charter thing. So I appreciate all of that. Um, I actually don't have any questions. I feel like we're really, well informed on the work that's happening at the library. I will say that um, I appreciate the emphasis on the um, on the safety and security work that's done. And I know we've talked about it already in terms of the the bond measure investments and things. But just as as a really important ongoing conversation, both with community and staff, um, that's something that you know I'm going to be I'm interested in and then look forward to further conversations about that and all the ways in the budget that we are investing in that. Um, in that work right now. So thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bailey and, and Sonia. Sonia, I I got to witness you in action uh, at some of our uh, library advisory meetings and have always been so impressed and appreciative. Uh, so it's great to see the data and the numbers 
but I've also seen you in action and have seen how effective uh, the library has been in, in moving those equity goals. So thank you for that. And Dawn, thank you. Uh, ice cream stand, is that what I heard? You're doing something. <laughs> <laughs> <A> whole shop. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I wish you the best, Dawn. It's been a pleasure to work with you. And Aaron and Claire, I, I have the opportunity as the, the library advice, um, board liaison to sit in on many of your meetings. And uh, just so, I mean, there's nobody, uh, all of our CBACs are great, but I obviously have a fondness for, for you all. Uh, that like you, all of the board members just show up just like with 110% of how can we make our libraries the most special, wonderful places. Uh, and and you all do that. So just, and I, I don't know, Aaron, how long you've been on the board? Long time. Long, you're, you're done. And she's done. 10 years. Yeah, I mean, that's a commitment. <laughs> so <laughs> I think she's just going to take a break and then I'm going to woo her back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, thank you so much to all of our um, library advisory board members. Uh, you're also committed and I really appreciate that. Uh, Vale, I wanted to call out uh, the, the work. Sometimes I think we, we work in a silo, but I was glad to hear that you're working with the Coalition of Communities of Color. So that's great that we have these partnerships. Uh, I did have one question, and um, Aaron uh, and Claire brought it up about the internal service charges. Uh, I mean, obviously, you all have buildings, so I don't know, like, comparatively, uh, if that number is, is is high or is it acceptable, or I don't know if you had any thoughts about We that. haven't really done that analysis in a meaningful way. I think it's just a, uh, as the, as Claire and um, the CBAC folks pointed out, it's increasing and so some concern about doing that kind of analysis to understand is that in line and should we be concerned? Yeah, definitely. Great. Okay. Obviously, yeah, that should be something we should review. Uh, and then I appreciated the, uh, you mentioned the, the Holgate interior uh, design and the outreach. And I know like in East County, like there's such a huge amount of interest that people want to be involved, engaged. Uh, so I recognize how important that is. And East County really wants to participate. <laughs> We're happy to hear that. Excellent. And then the other thing I would just really highlight, like 52,000 kids have library cards. Like that's amazing. So, you know, you talked about, you know, libraries haven't been really, you know, ours haven't been revamped, you know, since you know the internet or google <laughs> but uh but to see you know i mean that's great where you've taken that technology and crossed over to connect fifty two thousand kids yeah. to our libraries so you make it so easy i mean it's just their student id card now yeah i just think that's brilliant yeah and i our staff have worked really hard on that and i'm really grateful to them so a lot of the things that just kind of magically happen uh, i know there's a lot of hard work behind uh but that that's that's so amazing. So uh, don't have any other questions. Just want to appreciate everyone um, in, in the library. I, I know when I talk to the librarians and people just have such a, a love uh, for libraries that work there and delivering those services and just want to appreciate all your work. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate it. The only thing I'll add is that that, that um, Connect, ID Connect program has benefited from some real solid support from the Library Foundation. Yes, and we would be remiss if we didn't um, thank the Library Foundation for all of their contributions as well. Thank you. I think we have more library coming up, though, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Come on down. And I just, uh, because that's my job to be the bearer of bad news, every party needs a pooper. And that's why I'm here. Um, we need to do a little time check. Yep. So we're already behind schedule for the morning and we have a lot more to go. Um, so thank you all the library team folks. We've got uh, Jeff Renfo. Jeff. Our favorite county economist. Uh, do you all need to gavel out and gavel in? Okay. So. No, it's just a briefing. Oh, it's a briefing. Duh. Thank you. <laughs> it's just, you know, I just got back from vacation. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's I, people think of me that way all the time. Um, so I think we'll turn it over to Jeff. Oh, no, this is me. <laughs> uh -oh, <it's> <laughs>
Um, so this is the library district uh, presentation. As you all are aware, you sit as the Multnomah County Library District Board. We have um, an IGA with the county to deliver library service to this community. Um, and then we have specific library district financial policies that um, pertain to the district as it translates into a department budget. I think it's Jeff now. Next slide, please. Um, I'm Jeff Renfro from the budget office. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm going to make up some time. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, so um, the piece of good news to start out with is that the um, library district will be able to hold their tax rate at $1.22 per thousand dollars of assessed value, which is still two cents below the $1.24. That's largely due to the impact of the urban renewal areas, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, we anticipate being able to keep it there at $1.22 for the next 10 years. Um, so that there's a few factors that could are a little bit up in the air, but um, we don't anticipate having to move up to the max for a while. Um, and at that rate, uh, the library can sustain hours and services as you all just heard about. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the other piece of great news that I'll start with is uh, this is year 10 of the library district that we're talking about. When the library district was formed, the idea behind all of it was to provide the library with 10 years of stable services. So success. <laughs> um, and I tell, call Mike Jasper and just say, look. <laughs> Um, and uh, this is going to be largely good news, my portion of this. So we're in a position where we're better than we expected to be um, with all of the initial modeling. I'll, I'll complicate that picture just a little bit, of course, by the end of this. Um, but as, uh, as always with the library, it's a, it's a pretty simple story to tell. Um, it's really the story of what's happening to property taxes versus what's happening to personnel cost growth. Don already talked about personnel costs making up the, the huge majority of library costs. Um, so when we're thinking about the future of property taxes and our personnel cost growth, we're focused on a couple of things right now. The impact of the urban renewal areas, which is um, uh, causing assessed value growth to be quite a bit higher than what is normal. So it's helping on the revenue side. It's masking what's happening on the development cycle side, which we're officially out of the property boom here. And we expect to be minus the URA adjustment. We'd expect to be at a pretty low level of property tax growth. On the expense side, uh, just like in the county general fund, we're very concerned about inflation. Uh, inflation is the, the one thing right now that could really uh, change the story drastically. And then the other piece is that all of the library's uh, represented employees are in Local 88, which has an open labor contract right now. So everything we're going to talk about over the next few slides assumes the status quo. If the contract settles different than the status quo, that would have an impact on this. Um, but the story looking forward is we expect increasing surpluses, which will lead to increasing fund balance. Next slide, please. Um, in the current year, uh, uh, property tax collections, uh, when the property tax roll was certified, came in better than we expected. This is something we talked about on the general fund side uh, back in November. But uh, the underlying assessed value growth was actually lower than we'd expected. That kind of um, final uh, coming out of the development cycle was more of a crash than a, a gradual decline. Um, but a portion of the River District URA came back early. It was a surprise when we saw the property tax uh, roll. So overall, assessed value growth was significantly higher than what we were anticipating. Next slide, please. So um, this is a, a lot of numbers, and I, I'll just point out a couple to you uh, before we get into the, the pictures that represent this stuff. But for assessed value growth, uh, the big number there is in year 12, we expect assessed value growth of 8.75%, which is you know, double what we would call a great year. Um, and that's the interstate corridor urban renewal uh, area returning its um, assessed value. And then I think three sort of medium sized URAs all happening in the same year. Um, compression, we, we don't anticipate uh, being a major problem going forward, but there's, there's still a lot of uncertainty around real market values, particularly in the downtown area, so we're watching it. And then on the, the cost change side, you'll see that in year nine, it says 21% up there. That's not, that's not real. That's just where we uh, transition from actual expenditures to budgeted expenditures. We always assume that the library fully spends their budget. Um, which which never happens, so that number won't stay at 21%. And then going forward, um, in year 12, the same year that we have that big bump on the revenue side, 
we expect uh, personal cost growth to be a little, or sorry, overall cost growth to be a little bit lower because that's when the ERP debt service comes out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, a lot of numbers, but I'll just point out a couple for you. So in uh, year 10, fiscal year 2023, the one that we're talking about, there is a, a red number there. It's about $38,000, which is effectively flat. So um, we don't need to worry about that just because it's red. In fiscal year 2024, again, there's a projected deficit, but because of the, the fund balance the library has, there are a lot of tools to deal with that. So we, we shouldn't be concerned with that. Um, and then the one, the one piece of, of sort of slightly negative information that um, uh, counteracts our overwhelmingly positive story is when you look at year 10 of the forecast right there at the bottom, you'll see that those surpluses are starting to shrink. So I'm obligated to tell you that we haven't slain our structural deficit. It still exists. We're just able to kind of cover it up for a few years due to these URA adjustments. Uh, you will hear me talk about the structural deficit a lot more in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a graphic version of, of what I've shown you. So in year eight. So is that taking into account us not increasing the um, one point dollar twenty two? Yeah, this assumes we're at a dollar twenty two for for all of these years. Okay. Um, so the, the big spike in the surplus in year eight, that was, you know, one of the pandemic years. So the library had really significant, uh, underspending that year when the branches were closed. Um, year nine, we're, we're currently anticipating something like break even, but there's probably going to be, um, not as much underspending, but there'll be underspending that year as well. And then in year 12, when we get that big URA bump, we expect those, those big surpluses. So if we go to the next slide, please. Those big surpluses mean that we have an increasing fund balance, um, which is um, not something that was anticipated when the district was formed, um, but it's a, uh, there's a, a lot of flexibility here. Uh, and Don is going to talk about what the plan is for um, using some of that kind of unexpected flexibility. So with that, um, I'm done and I'll pass it back to Don. Hello, Chair and Board. My name is Don Allgaier, Director of Operations for the Library. Uh, you're very familiar with this uh, graphic as, as basic as it is. Uh, the budget structure is that the revenue comes into the library district. It funds the um, department fund for the library, which is where all the expenditures for the services happen as a county department. Next slide. You can see the budget by funding source here. The, the big message on this is that the vast majority of the funding for the library comes from district tax revenue. There is a, a slight addition or a slight amount of other revenue. It's about 1% includes a million dollars in grants interest of $200,000 fines and fees of $15,000 expected and sales to the public of 7,500 over the years. You've seen the fines and fees go down as a matter of us eliminating fines uh, for the public uh, and the sales to the public have been uh, down for the last few years, especially as a part of the pandemic. We do expect that there will be increases to that amount for sales to the public over time, um, but the fines and fees are gonna remain relatively low over time. Next slide. Uh, we have a 128.2 total district budget for fiscal year 2023. That includes the $99.4 million contract with Multnomah County for library services, uh, nearly $10 million reserve, $500,000 in contingency, and then $18.5 million proposed transfer to the library capital fund. It is largely the result of pandemic underspending. Next slide. That library district capital fund is uh, expected to reach $53.6 million. That includes uh, $30.4.9 million that was already in the capital fund, that additional $18.5 million transfer, and then an expected $300,000 in interest. This year, we will be making a shift in terms of the requirements and on an ongoing basis, there will be a 
plan for spending money to support a bond related uh, capital uh, work. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what the specifics of those are, but that will result in $6.4 million in expenditures expected out of the library district capital fund with a contingency of $47.3 million. The goal with this change is to be able to spend some of the additional funds that are uh, accruing within the library district capital fund while maintaining the long term financial health of the library district. Next slide. Here you can see the library district capital fund. It's a proposed 5 year plan and it includes for the fiscal year 2023 a number of efforts to be able to support uh, capital projects for the library. This uh, this fund will be differentiated from the uh, capital improvement fund that is run by the Department of County Assets uh, in collaboration with the library. Uh, that fund seeks to really have system improvements for the buildings and to maintain the buildings over the longer term. And that's how those funds are spent. We have the library bond funds that are focused in on the specific projects uh, that are being um, uh, informed by the public and being implemented over the uh, eight years of the bond. And then these projects are all projects that uh, would be nice additional pieces to supporting uh, the library buildings and their development that either um, don't fit within the bond planning as it currently sits or is not um, is not qualified for bond funding. So an example of that is staff technology and efficiency. Staff uh, computers and technology uh, aren't covered by bond funds. So this is a way for the library to be able to make sure that those um, those systems are being improved alongside everything that's happening uh, for with the bond funding so that the public can expect really as those buildings are opening the um, the brand new exciting uh, uh, spaces that they are uh, going to be walking into. The, uh, the other item in here is the Terrace uh, Project Supplemental Funding um, for Central Library. And that's an, uh, a fairly big chunk of this. It is uh, the exterior space outside of the front of Central. It'll uh, mesh with the refresh work that is part of the bond over time. Uh, but it is uh, this is partially funded through funds from Prosper Portland. And uh, this money is meant to help supplement finishing that project, which uh, is a uh, is going to really change the nature of the front area of that space and making it more inviting for people to come and use that space. You there's quite a bit in here, so I would just encourage that if there are further questions about specifics within this uh, five year plan or concerns, we would we would be glad to answer those um, as well later. Next slide. This shows the relative size of those different projects within fiscal year uh, 2023. So again, you can see um, a large chunk of it is planning for interim spaces for the bond uh, work. It's the ability to move uh, equipment and furniture around, the ability to provide um, temporary library services, the ability to uh, move uh, uh, books uh, to and from uh, old buildings and new buildings, then secondarily the central terrace project, and then from there it goes to a number of uh, technology and space, uh, smaller space projects. Next slide. So um, just in summary, the highlights uh, are really about continued stable dedicated funding for the district. And as Jeff said, we're in a good place. We're really happy about that. But if you've learned anything about me at this point, I tend to be um, sort of future looking and fairly conservative and still haven't slain the structural deficit dragon. So in anticipation of that, we're really pleased to have that funding and expect that that will be something we're, we're happy we have in the future. 
sustainable services, and then, as I mentioned, a focus on the future. With that, if you have any questions, we're happy to take them. Great. Uh, do we have some questions, uh, Commissioner? Michael. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure I kind of understand the whole package here. So there are we are expecting surpluses in the midterm, haven't slain the dragon, but you know the surpluses because of the URAs, and the six point four million for twenty three in capital projects is a use of part of that surplus for twenty three. So uh, since Don isn't physically in the room, I, I can answer it. Um, so um, uh, we, we established a policy a few years ago where we had an increase in balance in the, the district fund. And the, the library wanted to use, knew they wanted to use some of that for capital. So we set up a separate district capital fund. And there's a transfer that happens every year. Um, anything that is above what the district transfers to the county to run the libraries and then what they need for um, contingency and reserve gets transferred to the library district or the cap library capital library district capital fund excuse me um, so there's been an increasing balance in that district capital fund so this is the first year where there's an explicit plan like here's our here's what we're going to do on uh, for the next five years and the plan is to have a rolling five-year plan um, to explain to to you all and to the public um, how they intend to use that balance in that fund so it's not directly tied to fiscal year 2023. Okay, thank you. That that's helpful. And I, I guess the then the follow up question I have is, um, as as that fund continues to grow, it, 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 I guess what I'm wondering is is there a smoothing process that we're engaging in? We've talked about smoothing in other parts of the budget, right? So, is there a smoothing process we're engaging in where a portion of that surplus is set aside each year in order to deal with the fact that at some point we're going to be back in a structural deficit? Yeah. So I think. I think uh, and when you look at the, the current plan for the yearly spend down, it, it's still going to leave us with a, a significant balance. So I think it's also part of figuring out if there are portions of the sort of ongoing operations of the library that we could more closely associate with that funding. Um, and then also figuring out, like, as all this new space opens, is there are there additional needs there? So part of the idea behind the, that balance that the district had um, is knowing that we're going to be in a position in the future where deficits are going to, to come back and will it will allow us to sort of buy some more time um, as we go forward. So it's it's part of the plan, but it's not it's not like explicit this much money is going to go to this year yet. I would also highlight what Jeff just mentioned in terms of the new spaces, you know, ultimately we'll be significantly increasing the footprint of the library and changing up and there's we're still not 100% sure what those costs associated with that will be. Um, so this gives us that flexibility to address that as those sorts of challenges start to surface. Thank you. And I would just add that one of the reasons that the projects are focused in on bond related is because we know as we get out into those later years, we will need to start to make adjustments in, in lowering the expenditures in that fund. Thanks, Don. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you. Um, so just not too many questions. One is just there's I, we're talking about like the impacts of the URAs rolling off and how that uh, there's no you haven't heard anything about potentially like looking at adding additional URAs down the line. Have you? Uh, yes, um, <laughs> <laughs> but there is one that I'm it sounds like it's going to happen. I'm I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say the, the name <laughs> quite yet because I, I'm not sure what exactly is public and what Prosper Portland has sort of kindly told me about. Um, but I, there is going to be, I think, at least one new one I'm pretty certain about. And uh, the way that that is going to going to be incorporated into the forecast is it it'll make an impact as the assessed value grows away from that frozen base. So it's not going to have a big immediate impact like the return of the URAs is going to have. It's we'll just incorporate a slightly um, smaller assessed value growth factor into the forecast going forward. Okay. I appreciate that. Cause I also I mean that's also something that's like, hey, it's great news when they roll off, but then when they do come on board, they definitely have an impact. And I know that we have to kind of have some approval of, of those as a as a partner. Um and then I feel like every couple of years for the last 10 years of my life, I've had like somebody explained the definition of compression. And um, 
And it's like one of those, I don't know. It's like, I always need the refresher just because it's a, could, would you mind giving like a nice, succinct, like what is compression and how does it impact, you know, our property tax? Yeah, sure. So let me give you like a very, a very simplified uh, explanation. So pretend we have one property uh, and the uh, assessed value of that property is $100, right? And we have a tax rate of 10%, right? So you would say, I'm going to take 10% of $100, I would expect to collect $10 in taxes. But then we add another value on top of it. And let's say that the real market value is $200 and that we have a constitutional cap that says 4.5% of your real market value is, is the cap, right? So we take that 4.5%, we apply it to $200, we get a cap of $9. So the tax bill says you should have to pay us 10 but you are only going to pay us nine. So that, that $1 difference, we would say we lost a dollar in compression, or I would come to you and I would say compression was 10% this year. Okay, I really appreciate that because I think it's always good because it's such a weird thing because it's such an, it is an artificial limitation on what we're able to raise, um, but it's in our state constitution. So I think it's good to know. Thank you so much. Sure, Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. That was a great explanation. Thank you. I, I've really been I've really been working on it. I get I get asked about it. So like every year, I get like a little bit better at it. Yeah. Well done. Uh, so when you talk about the structural deficit, Jeff, and I don't know, Chair Kaffer asked, uh, we're at a dollar twenty-two. We can go up to a dollar twenty-four. Is that two cent? Like, how does that account for the structural deficit, or or does it not? Um, so it, it'll allow us to, so let me, I think um, it's been a couple of years since I calculated what a, a penny is, but it, it was $700,000 a couple of years ago. It might be like seven fifty dollars now. Um, but so what it'll, what it'll allow us to do is as we start, get to that period where there's, um, you know, we expect to have a deficit, we'll have the option of, of increasing the tax rate and it might push the deficit off for a year or two. Um, so the we just are going to continue to need to be creative as you know the deficit starts to come closer. Um, so before we had incorporated the impact of the URAs, the library had started to implement um, a one percent constraint every year. So th there's no way to to solve it, but we can try to kind of just like continue to push it off into the future. And so, is there pot potential then that there would be a uh, increased constraint in future years in? I, it's I, it's so far into the future at this point, which I think is is part of the good news. But at some point, if we have raised the tax rate to as high as it can go, um, and we get to the point where we have deficits, then a constraint would would be the way to to deal with that. Um, but you know, I, I I should say like I, four years ago, I would have said you know we're looking at imposing you know constraints as we go. And then we were able to incorporate the URA change. So th there's a lot that can happen in, in 10 years, but that would be the tool that we would use just like we do in the general fund. Very good. Thank you so much. Mr. Myron. Thank you. Um, uh, and thank you, Commissioner Vega Peterson for asking the question about compression. Yeah, each time I, it's like, okay, yeah. I get it. Um, and a little bit more. And Jeff, you really did. I love that example. It really did. You you have gotten it down. So um, so thank you for that. Uh, otherwise, I, I don't think I have any additional questions. <laughs> and with that, we've come to the end of the library presentation. I'm reading. <laughs> um, Bailey, I do want to, my memo from my wonderful staff, Elizabeth Curry, does say at the very top of it, what are you reading with a little book, <laughs> stack of books? <laughs> so, Bailey, would you like to tell us what you're reading? Right now? I will. I just actually finished two, I went on vacation, which meant I got to actually read books. And I read uh, Amor Toll's new book, The Lincoln Highway. And he wrote The Gentleman in Moscow, which was a brilliant, brilliant book. He's really great at creating characters and telling a story. And I definitely still prefer Gentleman in Moscow, but The Lincoln Highway was wonderful. And it was a great, he did a great job of telling the story. Um, did you read Rules of Civility? 
No, um, my wife did. She's a huge Amor Tolls fan. Um, and she, she, Jeremy and Moscow for her is like one of her, the best books she's ever read. And so Rules of Civility, I think, I, in fact, I asked, she, we swapped books on vacation and um, she ranked them, Gemlin and Moscow, Lincoln Highway, Rules of Civility. Oh, interesting, okay. Yeah, but then I also read a really brilliant book that is not new, Chang Ray Lee, he wrote on Such a Full Sea, also just a brilliant writer, both in terms of how he, develops characters, but his language. And um, his, one of his early books is called A Gesture Life. And it's about a man who is set during, sort of during World War II and then after World War II and about his experience. He's Japanese American and his experience both in the army and then in later years um, as an elderly man and sort of reflecting back on his life. And it talks about um, the um, comfort women um, in Japan, which was very disturbing, um, but also again a really amazing story. And he is—he's a brilliant. Uh, he's just—he's one of my favorites. So that's what I got. Will you um, repeat the name of the author? For that one? Um, Chang Ray Lee. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you all very much. And if we can I just say, just quickly, I'm sorry. Thank you, Don Algar. Um, we're gonna miss you like mad but um, we're happy for you and for your family. And also um, Katie Shifley, who's replacing Don, was supposed to be here today, but she's home ill. Um, she's terrific. She's already meeting with Jeff and Christian. Um, and I think we've got a, a good replacement. And then I also just want to say a quick thank you to Jeff, to Christian and her team for their you know, continued terrific support in helping us manage through all of this. So. I think we can all take a moment and give Don a big round of applause for all of us. Thank you very much. It's, it's been a pleasure working here. We are going to miss you. You've been fabulous, but we will all come visit you. Why don't you just give a little shout out to your um, ice cream shop, please. Tell us the name of it and where it's located. It's the Sea Breeze in Rockaway Beach. It's a giant purple building in the middle of town, so you can't miss it. <laughs> and it's more than ice cream. Oh, oh yeah, I follow on Instagram and it just makes me hungry every time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, that was fun. And now we're gonna continue the fun because we have the health department. Yeah, come on down. Uh, as we're getting ready, I'll just um, message here. Uh, we are going to just continue on to 12.15. We're not going to stop to take breaks. So if people need to take breaks, please do. If you see a commissioner leave the room, it's not because they don't care deeply about the topic. It's because they probably uh, need to use the restroom. So, um, but we do need to have a hard stop at 12.15 because I know folks have um, appointments. So. Uh, but we will re if whatever we don't hit today, we will pick up again. Do not do not fear. We will not let the health department go without a lot of time for conversation. So good morning, Ebony. Good morning, Chair, Commissioners. My name is Ebony Clark, and I am the health department director. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, you're going to hear from several leaders uh, from the health department today and in the days to come as we present our budget process and priorities for the next fiscal year. Um, I'd also like to just take a minute to thank you in advance for your patience and grace um, with us during this process. Um, several of our directors who will be presenting, this will be their first time doing budget presentations. And then for public health, our director is out. And so the deputy and some other key public health leaders will be presenting for the first time. So thank you in advance for your patience and grace with us. Next slide. So today you're going, we are going to cover um, the Community Budget Advisory Committee priorities. Um, you'll hear a little bit about 
our uh, budget overview and specifically the approach um, that we took as we centered around equity um, and more specifically racial equity. You'll get a health department WESP update. Um, we'll delve into the budget overview. Um, we'd like to take a minute during this time to also highlight um, department wide successes and then we'll start to kind of go into some high points specific to um, each division. Um, we'll also touch on new one time only and backfill general fund. Um, in addition to we'll touch on the state federal impacts and other policy issues. Um, and then, of course, we'll be sure to touch on COVID-19 and the American Rescue Plan programs um, and give an update in terms of where we're at currently and then what we are proposing for uh, fiscal year 2023. And then we'll have time for questions. Next slide. Um, but to kick it off, we wanted to start with uh, highlighting and having the Community Budget Advisory Committee talk about their process and their priorities. I want to thank you for taking time to come in person. And I don't know if we have a couple of folks who are joining us virtually. And so I will hand it over to our health department, CBAC, who will introduce themselves and then talk more specifically about their priorities. Morning. Morning. We just pulling down our masks for these kind of like, all right, that sounds good. I'm um, hi, my name's CJ Alejandro. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I've been on the CBAC, uh, the Community Budget Advisory Committee for about, gosh, what's it been, two years? Yeah, and uh, Rhonda, you want to introduce yourself? And my name uh, is Rhonda Combs, and likewise, and I am a new on the board. Thank you. All right. Well, I mean, we can talk a little. I mean, you're familiar with the process. We've been meeting uh, to discuss the budget items for the health department for about uh, latest for about the last year. Um, we get together and uh, discuss. We, we choose our kind of our top 10 and then we all meet and discuss uh, which ones uh, we chose and why. And we negotiate over the course of a couple months and then we submitted our letter. What is about a month or some change ago? And uh, oh, let's take a look at our feedback process. Um, let's see. Yes, we all come from different uh, categories. We all come from different occupations within the city. I'm a social worker. I work with Cascadia Behavioral Healthcare uh, with a project respond team who does a mental health crisis response. Uh, Rhonda, what do you do? So I'm a family advocate, community health worker, and um, case management. So that's what I do with human solutions. And I also do it with, um, I'm sure you guys probably don't know them, but Playgirl Learn. So that's what I'm doing in the community. Mm -hmm. And I work with the homeless. Mm -hmm. And so do I. I work primarily with people who are either um, just discharging from the hospital, typically Unity Center for Behavioral Health, or um, people who are living outside. Um, and then the other members, I feel like we have like eight or nine other members, it feels like. Um, come from different, we have some financial uh, people, we've gotten other social workers, um, people all over the county. Um, and yeah, the decision we made, decisions are all based on a, a strong code of ethics that we come up with and agree on at the beginning. And everything is very um, equity and diversity focused, uh, focused on supporting people who are the most impacted by the decisions we're making with the health department. Um, and with that, I mean, we can start talking about what we chose. That would that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to can be quick. Um, is that the next slide? Oh, okay. Yeah, and you saw the letter. I'm just going to talk about some of the ones that I know more about, and then Rhonda, you can talk about the others. But um, I mean, first priority for many of us, and I, I think speaking for a lot of behavioral health workers in town, is the Behavioral Health Resource Center, both the... Um, the shelter and the day center programs of it. Um, you know, I have friends working at, uh, we're working at Bud Clark Commons. I have lots of friends at Central City Concern, Transition Projects, LifeWorks, um, Janice Youth, uh, Outside In, all across the county doing similar work and having, having just one center um, that's open, you know, I feel like what, 15, 16 hours a day was a good chunk of the day where people can come and get directed to services and find a place to just sit down, get out of the rain and whatever weather we're expecting this year um, is going to be incredibly important. So yeah, we're huge support 
um, supports for that um, among, I think it was number one and two for most of us. Um, so that's a pretty easy one. Uh, Rhonda, you want to talk about the childhood mental health program? Um, for early childhood uh, mental health, I think one of the reasons why we had actually chose that was because we have so many children, young children going to through so many trauma experience within the homes, within the community, walking, seeing different people, you know, shot, killed, all manner of things. And our children are being sent back to school without that mental health support. And we don't want to traumatize them or we want to nip it in the bud, you know, before they get to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or whatever, so they can have a successful life. So um, as far as for me, I felt like that was very vital for our young children today. And even for our teens and our youth, you have so many just their escape, it's taken their lives and we need to stop it. So um, that's one of the reasons why I really support um, mental health within our early childhood. And um, as far as our partnership with the uh, Old Town, I also kind of feel like even in that situation, we have so many people that are homeless, so many people that have mental issues and we need to focus on what makes our community and what makes our community strive and make our community um, be successful. And we can't forget about those that seems like they are lost and we have no passion or empathy for them. They have a human life, something allow them to get there, be a trauma. And I feel like that's something that we really want to focus on and bring back our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I'll just add to that. Yeah, you know, I have a six year old. They went through Albina Head Start. Um, they're in Portland Public Schools right now. And so, yeah, we're and um, other CBAC members also have young children. So it's very important to us, but also, you know, it's it's good for all. Um, and as for the downtown peer services, you know, kind of falling back to the Behavioral Health Resource Center, we're just focused on making sure people have some kind of supports. And uh, if we can, we we push for uh, non-police uh, oriented interventions as much as we can. Um, that's what my team at Project Respond tries to do, tries to incorporate mental health without um, an armed response. And I think having uh, peer services is gonna go hand in hand with some of the, offer, uh, some of the uh, supports that are coming through the resource center. I mean, I think it would work hand in hand. They could help the people, direct them to where they got to go. Um, as for the next one, the medical examiner, I mean, this is kind of personal for me. We, you know, I worked in a residential facility for people diagnosed with severe and persistent mental illness. And we saw mm, three deaths in the course of about 12 months. And, you know, one of those deaths was uh, under circumstances we never were able to find out about because uh, they didn't have a medical examiner on hand who could provide the, uh, the research they needed to do to find out more. And we never got that information. You know, just having one on board is gonna be an extra. It's just gonna make it a lot quicker for a lot of families, a lot of people who are waiting on that. Um, you know what I mean? And um, I was just thinking, um, just did it on what you had said, mm -hmm. but a medical examiner, examiner, I really feel like you know, that makes a family even feel complete that they know what was the reason mm -hmm. for the death of their loved ones. Because some people can't move on without those answers. And if you're waiting for a year, six months, nine months, you have that person's life on hold. And I think that is a very great asset to add to what we're doing in the community um, with another medical examiner. Mm -hmm. And I'll add at this point that I think we also voted to get them another car. Another car. Yeah. And that was an easy one. That was like, you're asking for just a, some thousands to get a car. One time, one time. Sure, okay, you can have your car. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Future Generations Collaborative, which I know that, you know, the chair and other folks are familiar with. You know, I was fortunate enough to go to a presentation by a uh, Jolene Joseph, who works with the Native Wellness Institute. And, you know, Future Generations Collaborative for people who are not as familiar, um, they work specifically with young parents and people with, uh, who are affected by fetal alcohol syndrome disorder. Um, but also just a great way for the county and NARA and NIA and all the uh, Future Generations Collaborative kind of members to uh, be incorporated in the work that we're all doing together. Like, I'm always a huge supporter of uh, going to people who have uh, our community members who have uh, Indigenous ties to this land in uh, directing what we're 
all doing with it together. Um, not to go on a huge rant about it. Uh, did you have anything else to say about that? Okay. Oh, man. Um, oh, the additional. Yeah. Oh, I was going to just move on. The additional uh, deputy director for the health department. I think mean, I looked at the, the person who wrote up the info for this one, and their whole point was that the health department's gone through a lot the last couple of years, especially, and that's been um, all done without this additional deputy director. Um, we all thought it made a lot of sense. I mean, Ebony, would you agree? Yes, that we could um, benefit from having just another, um, some, some more leadership on hand. And kind of the flip side to that was the next one, the human resources, additional recruiters, like leadership, and then also getting more of our people, because I don't know what it's like in the health department, but, you know, at the uh, behavioral health organizations in town, keeping all our staff recruited and re retained has been a struggle. I don't know, do you all want to say anything more about that? I, I think too, uh, my thought about the uh, human resource um, additional bodies, I feel like that um, in that circumstance, we have so many human resource managers or even those that um, follow under that are just overwhelmed and not being able to have the asset to be able to hire in the people because they don't have that resource within their own offices. And so I really think that that's very important to get additional recruiters and get some more bodies out here working and taking off some of the pressure and the load because we don't want to burn out one another. And then we look up and what we're talking about to alleviate is happening within our own you know, organization. So that's one reason why I thought that that's a must. Mm -hmm. And the interest in keeping us brief, because I know we have what a hard stop at 1215. Um, yeah, the last, we already talked about the other additional vehicle for the medical examiner, but I'll just put in a, a quick blurb for the Rockwood Health Center uh, improvements. You know, my, my child goes to the Multnomah County Southeast Health Center and like the improvements there. And um, it's just really important to keep our health centers operating as efficiently as possible. Um, so that was another thing that we all uh, prioritized. And with that, we could go on, but we're going to stop there. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you again for um, coming out in person. And, you know, I, I just want to highlight how you all's priorities also really center and highlight. Um, um, and there's this continuity between the chair's priorities, too. So thank you so much. And so we'll kind of swap out seats and we'll continue with our presentation. And as you're thank heading, you. I just want to say thank you so much from all of us. We we appreciate you not only signing up to do the work of the CVAC, but the work that you do on a day to day basis is making a huge um, impact on our community. So the fact that you work, you have such important day jobs, and then you spend your free time um, helping better our community in a different way on the CVAC is really impressive, and we're we're honored to have you. So thanks. Thank so you. Thank you, Chair, and thank, thank you, you, Commissioners. Yeah, now we're both off to work. <laughs> Go forth and do do good. Trista, can you do the next slide, Trista? Next slide. Oh, okay, awesome. All right. So as we move forward, we just wanted to take a minute to center um, the health department and our work and how we made some decisions. And so just want to touch briefly on the mission, the vision, and the values of the health department. And so our vision is um, thriving communities that nurture the health and resilience of all. We work with communities to advance health equity and protect the most vulnerable and to promote uh, wellness and health for everyone. Um, again, our vision is thriving communities that nurture and health, uh, that nurture the health and resilience of all. Um, our values are compassion and care, empowerment, integrity, racial equity and connection. So just simply put in the health department, we lead with race. Um, we work to support the health and resilience of all. Uh, we work with communities to advance the health equity to protect the most vulnerable. Next slide. You know, I also think it's important to take just a minute to kind of show a snapshot of who we are as a health department and, and what we do as it is so vast, robust and complex as well as interconnected. In the health department, we touch the lives of all who live in Multnomah County. Um, our public health division promotes and protects the health 
centering around policy strategies and programs that improve the population health and quality of life for our Multnomah County residents. Um, also within the health public health department division, we work to reduce racial and ethnic disparities related to the leading, leading causes of death, illness, injury, and those suffering. The Multnomah County Health Officer Program provides physician support across the health department, works across all departments, and engages external partners across the region and the state to promote health and to prevent disability and disease. In our integrated clinical services area, also referred to as the community health center, it's the largest FQHC, which is the federally qualified health center in Oregon, providing care to residents in Multnomah County, which includes focusing and prioritizing low income and the uninsured. And so there's a continuum from primary care, integrated behavioral health, wraparound supports, dental services, pharmacy services, and then services that are also in our school health centers. When we think about the work that we do in the health department specific to behavioral health, um, the mission of the behavioral health division is to enhance and maintain a high quality, accessible, client driven, culturally responsive, and trauma informed system of care to promote recovery for all individuals living with mental illness and or substance use. And then lastly, we have our corrections health division, which really works to assure access to care and safeguard the health of uh, our individuals we serve in detention. Next slide. So this slide is just to re reorient you to kind of the current structure of the health department. What you'll see is that we have eight divisions um, with diverse but not interconnected services. Um, and our FY23 proposed budget um, is just under 400 million, not including our COVID specific and ARP investments. Next slide. So this is just a highlight that touches on our, our approach and our strategic priorities. The health department leadership team proposed a budget that worked to strengthen public health infrastructure, deepen our collaborative work specific to black indigenous um, and other communities of color and immigrant communities. Um, our priorities center and uplift the work specific to further uh, innovations and investments in behavioral health and to address the complex needs um, of our workforce. Um, specifically, our priorities were workforce equity and resilience in care to look at how do we ensure health department implements recommendations prioritized in phase one of our workforce equity strategic plan, um, really working to continue to accelerate culture change and efforts to support our organization's recovery from trauma and the intensity of the COVID response and to look at how we continue to invest and uplift staff through recognition, recovery, and retention. Um, we have the priority to look at how we build skill among the health department managers and supervisors to continue to highlight and improve um, the way that we lead inclusively with race um, and to enhance the capacity to recruit a diverse and, and, and innovative, talented workforce. Uh, another priority was specific to our COVID response and recovery as we are still in a pandemic and responding. And so a goal around looking at how do we prevent severe illness and death from COVID-19 among those disproportionately affected by the underlying health conditions and higher risk of and those who are at higher risk of infection. Um, as we lead as we are the lead agency in Multnomah County uh, responding to COVID-19, um, we have to work to assure that we are working closely with our public health and health officer, but working in alignment to assure that we are um, leveraging all of our resources, but then also working in alignment and leveraging our collaboration and partnership with also um, emergency operations and emergency management across the county. Uh, we also have a priority to look at how do we uh, center our work around health promotion, prevention, and early intervention. Um, working to renew and revitalize health, uh, public health efforts focused on the leading causes of death and other drivers of premature disability and death, um, centering around targeting mental health and substance use services for high risk populations impacted by the pandemic, especially children and youth uh, and those living uh, in unhoused situations. And then working to reduce recidivism by partnering 
in the delivery of whole person health care and transition services for the community members in custody. Uh, our last two priorities um, center around access to quality care. So how do we expand our street based and population specific outreach to increase patient access to address the pandemic related delays in care and continue to work to assure our continuing care is transformative in our priorities and our investments, um, especially as we work to address the behavioral health issues. Um, especially from a crisis oriented lens and then last was priority around critical infrastructure. How do we continue to uh, not lose sight and rebuild uh, foundational public health programs and core capabilities? Um, how do we work to strengthen internal infrastructure to support the entire department, especially as we work to continue to respond to the pandemic and so many more um, issues that we navigate and have responsibility to respond to? And then how do we also work to implement workplace safety plans across our all of our health department facilities. Next slide. So here I uh, just want to touch um, on the uh, new county general fund investment priorities and you know want to take again a moment to thank chair Kapori um, for her priorities. And so um, we have a few budget priorities. So first there's uh, the behavioral health investments, which total to about 4.2 million. Um, the first is 2.2 million of uh, CGF uh, that's dedicated to supporting um, those individuals who um, are experiencing homelessness and impacted by problematic drug use and housing. And so basically this is the funding for the Behavioral Health Resource Center where 150 individuals will be served. Super excited about that coming online this fall. Then we have 1.1 million uh, to increase peer support capacity for those with co occurring disorders. And then there's another million to provide um, the much needed expansion to our school based mental health prevention program, taking it and expanding it from kindergarten to third grade now all the way up to, to 12th grade. Then in public health, we have prevention and early intervention investments of about 924,000. Um, 405,000 uh, earmarked for homeless encampment and vector control, 169,000 for the work specific to the Future Generation Collaborative, uh, and then 350,000 to expand capacity for the Pacific Islander community based organizations um, by adding additional uh, capacity um, to help promote community based uh, promote programming. And then in our integrated clinical services, also known as our community health center, um, we're continuing to look at how do we assure access to high quality care. And so this is a $2 million investment in the Rockwood Health Center, um, specifically uh, in the category of capital improvement, um, which basically will allow for a much needed uh, building infrastructure Im improvement. And this is a, a critical uh, facility um, where folks are receiving services. Just want to take a minute to highlight that this is one of the most diverse um, patient populations that are served in ICS. Um, about 43% of uh, patients who receive their care at Rockwood identify in the BIPOC um, category, and about 37% um, request interpretation services. And then lastly, um, no, oh, next slide. Okay, last, lastly, we have the department infrastructure uh, investments. And so, again, thank you for the additional funding to support a second deputy within the health department. We've continued to see significant growth over the years. Um, and so, being able to have that infrastructure operational and leadership support will um, continue to help move our work forward. We also have about an $800,000 investment for um, human resources, which will continue to support. Um, our recruiting efforts, um, especially as we continue to um, address the workforce shortage needs and continuing to respond to the pandemic. And then uh, the last two priorities, uh, one is uh, specific to the continuity of operations. So basically the work that we also do within the health department around emergency management um, that's more broad than just COVID response. And so we'll be able to bring on a, a continuity of operations coordinator that will be housed in the director's office. 
Um, and then lastly, uh, 300,000 for the work of leading um, the Beacon effort, which is a community um, wide community partner effort that the county will be stepping into to lead in behavioral health. And Beacon stands for Behavioral Health Emergency Coordinated Network. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in this presentation. Next slide. And so also thought it would be important to just show kind of quickly just uh, what our cross department alignment and collaboration looks like. And so first within the section of emergency management, we know that coordination and alignment um, are better when we um, are intentionally partnering across not only the department, but across the county. Um, we've, we've had some key strides as we've made collaborating key strides and we've been intentional at looking at how do we um, try to break down silos um, and in the county and the department this past year, we've been intentional around looking at how do we not only lean on just um, the county emergency management or just our health officer or public health, but how do we work intentionally in a coordinated way to leverage all of the resources in the health department um, to bring a more uh, rapid and more effective, efficient response to what we do in responding to all of the um, kind of emergent events that happen that we have the responsibility to responding to. Then another area that we want to highlight that uh, we think is important to touch on is the transit-based behavioral health planning. And so what that is, is that that is an effort where um, we are working with TriMet and the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office um, and the Behavioral Health Division to look at how do we more effectively um, assess uh, what the behavioral health needs are for those that use um, our transit services throughout the city, and how do we develop a uh, an effective, robust um, response in terms of programming and crisis um, to, again, look at how do we serve those individuals that may be in some type of a behavioral health crisis so that they don't end up having to uh, end up either in the hospital and or um, in jail. Um, we have our preschool for all effort, which is a continued effort where we are working with the uh, Department of County Human Services or Community Human Services to expand um, mental health capacity for um, preschools and Head Start uh, throughout the um, entire county. And again, it's looking at how do we get upstream to prevent and mitigate folks, uh, children and youth having to end up in higher levels of care down the road. Plus, we also know that this also is more cost effective. Um, we have our behavioral health housing efforts where we have um, the partnership with the joint office where we're looking at the supported housing services and funds and looking at how do we continue to prioritize and bring forward innovative programming to um, better stabilize and house those who are impacted by severe, severe persistent mental illness. And then we have our gun violence prevention efforts where between behavioral health and public health, we are looking at um, upstream and downstream strategies to address um, the gun violence in the community. And so looking at um, how we do uh, community capacity building, how we are bringing forward a behavioral health, mental health um, response team, um, and then also just continued pro-social activities for uh, youth and young adults um, an effort to keep them um, engaged. Next slide. And Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Jaya Paul, Myron, uh, Chair Kafuri, Peterson, Stegman. My name is Maria Lisa Johnson, and I, I use she, her uh, pronouns. I am the organizational development director for the health department and until recently was overseeing the equity efforts in our department. Um, what I'd like to do is just give you a brief overview of how we've invested in our equity work in the department. And you will be hearing a whole lot more detail from each of our divisions as we go through. This slide is really highlighting the service focused divisions. And within our public health and health officer, what I'd like to highlight is that in the 2023 budget, 
The 2023 budget expands within public health partnerships within our uh, communities of color. It adds culturally specific staffing. It shores up our communicable disease program that had been really impacted before and then was so critical in that pandemic to ensure that we have future capacity and access and reach. Um, it adds death investigators for the health officer program who play a key role in documenting the leading causes of death and disparities by race and ethnicity. Within behavioral health, the 2023 budget prioritizes culturally responsive services for BIPOC and LGBTQI communities. And it builds capacity and expands technical assistance for BIPOC-led peer provider organizations. In corrections health, our next year proposed budget adds an equity manager specifically to corrections health to support equity efforts within that division, unify the efforts across the different sites. Um, it enhances also the transition services program to address social determinants of health and it adds culturally specific providers. Within uh, the community health center, next year's budget invests in the racial equity and diversity initiative, also called READY, to monitor, analyze, and recommend policy and infrastructure to reduce race-based disparities in care. It expands the transition team uh, for care and adds a health engagement and access team to reduce barriers to care for uh, patients who identify as BIPOC. Next slide, please. So as you may recall, the health department implemented a participatory approach to our implementation of our workforce equity strategic plan. And over 20 employees took part in the equity leadership program, developed specific recommendations across key areas of work, including recruitment. So refining our position descriptions and interview panels focused on equity, um, adding a mentoring program to enhance the retention of uh, particularly employees of color during the first year trial period, and then adding a manager onboarding position, refining and expanding our access to accommodations for those employees needing supports, and then investing more in career pathways. And um, so for the next slide, thank you. What I'd like to do is just highlight a few of our successes and lessons learned as we've been implementing the Workforce Equity Strategic Plan. Uh, so our equity leadership program, as I just mentioned, will be replicated within the Office of Diversity and Equity at the county level. And in part because it involves more people in owning the work of the Workforce Equity Strategic Plan. So it's being considered a best practice. Our Mentoring Matters program will be replicated within the Sheriff's Office and we're in conversation with the Sheriff's Office about what might work for them. Uh, the Mentoring Matters program did inaugurate this year, and we have a coordinator for that program. We have 20 mentors so far and 11 mentees with really robust stories about that experience that you can read into uh, on our website. We've launched the ADA uh, online repo repository, which was one of the recommendations from our program. And that repository adds specific information and steps so that employees seeking accommodation and managers wanting to support them can do that more readily. And we're developing a recruitment training video in collaboration with the County Organizational Learning Program to support managers in applying an equity lens in recruitment. So very specific tailored aspects of workforce equity strategic plan. Next slide, please. In terms of our lessons learned, um, we're thankful that the board and, and you, Chair Kafori, invested in our Workforce uh, Equity Strategic Plan Implementation Manager position. This position has been really a key contributor in tracking progress and helping support our organization in uh, implementing the specific recommendations from our equity leadership program. Um, and it is a unique position in the county and uh, very, very uh, critical to, to the implementation pieces, especially as we have been so immersed in the COVID response. 
um, we understand that employee communications is critical to accountability and morale. And we need to do that uh, more frequently. And so we've launched a, a newsletter that reports on the progress of, of our implementation of workforce equity. And we acknowledge also that our uh, colleagues and partners within our human resources division carry a significant responsibility for the progress of the implementation of the WESP. And their commitment is high, but their capacity is very stretched currently. And so just acknowledging that. Uh, what's coming, our equity leaders want to pri uh, prioritize the transformational work, the culture change work, alongside what is more compliance within the WESP. And so that is a consistent uh, direction with our strategic priorities, and we hope within the next year that that will take place in a more uh, organizational way, more, more in depth. I'm passing it to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So um, I'm Wendy Lear. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the deputy director for the health department. Um, thank you, commissioners and Chair Kapori for having us here today. So um, this first slide is a comparison of our budget uh, by fund. And in the general fund, you'll see um, growth of about $15 million. And that includes um, just under $7 million in new investments in behavioral health, public health, and in department infrastructure, and $3 million of um, one time only general fund, uh, 2 million of which is the Rockwood uh, Capital Construction General Fund. In the federal and state fund, um, that has grown by uh, $10 million, and that is uh, mostly uh, accounted for in the public health modernization funding. So 9 million of that is in public health. And then um, in this slide, you'll see a new fund, which is the FQHC Enterprise Fund. And so this is the, the uh, fund that Eric uh, Ariolano, our CFO, has been working on um, since October in establishing a new fund where all of the resources dedicated to the Community Health Center will be um, aggregated and collected in this single fund. So it combines um, what was previously federal and state funding uh, and general funding revenue into a single fund. And then finally, um, the COVID fund uh, has declined this year um, by about $19 million, and that's just a reflection of changes in strategy and uh, practices in public health uh, for the most part. Uh, next slide, please. So this just gives you a little bit more information about um, our five-year trending um, in the health department. It includes that the line on the top is our total budget um, over the last five years, which has you know, increased uh, significantly with the start of the pandemic and is leveling off at this point. Um, but it also includes some of our other large funds. And I think um, the most notable on here is the green diamond, which was uh, which I just mentioned. That is uh, the initiation of the enterprise fund for um, for our community health center. That fund uh, was established mid year this year and will be in full effect um, next year. It does combine uh, revenue from the Fed, what was previously in the federal and state fund, and that's why you see that purple line taking a dip. It's not that our federal and state fund has declined uh, that much in, in 23. It's actually grown. It's just that revenue that was recorded there is now in that enterprise fund uh, for the health center. So uh, next slide. Um, this is a slide that uh, depicts our FTE uh, changes uh, for the last five years. And so in 23, our FTE have grown by 152 FTE. And just under uh, 39 of, the, of that total is the conversion of limited duration uh, positions that we um, added during the pandemic. So at the start of the pandemic, we added a number of limited duration positions, mostly in public health. 
and uh, many of them are now nearing their two year um, maximum. And uh, in discussions with the local 88, they declined to extend uh, our agreement uh, to uh, our request to extend LDAs beyond two years. They declined that, so we have converted 39 uh, positions to um, regular status employees. And then the remaining increase um, is also uh, primarily focused in uh, public health. So, in addition to the limited duration positions that were converted, there's an additional 43 positions in public health funded with public health modernization funding, another 33 positions in behavioral health, uh, 16 of those are from new general fund funding, and then there's also uh, nine for uh, preschool for all funding and six for supportive housing funding. So. Uh, quite a significant increase in personnel in both behavioral health and public health. And then lastly, um, our community health center or integrated clinical services has added uh, just under 18 positions, kind of net positions, and those are uh, primarily focused in uh, behavioral health providers within the clinical setting, triage the nursing, and some outreach and engagement staff. And then uh, finally, the percentage of employees by bargaining unit really hasn't changed uh, significantly um, in 23 or honestly um, for the last five years. The, the uh, percentage of local 88 continues to be just under 70% of our workforce. Uh, management and executive staff are um, 13% and um, ONA, uh, ONA represents just under 11% of our workforce. Next slide, please. Um, this slide gives you just a little bit more detail on FTE um, by fund. And again, uh, in the COVID fund, it's the, it's the first bar, uh, group of bars right in the middle. Um, that just uh, reflects the conversion of 39 FTE in the COVID fund um, to uh, regular status employees. And then there are a couple of additional, six additional uh, personnel in the COVID fund for next year. And then, uh, then the uh, growth in federal and state fund personnel and in the general fund um, are about evenly split, 35 uh, increased FTE in fed state fund from public health modernization mostly. Um, and then 42 additional FTE, uh, which are primarily new priorities um, in the executive budget uh, for behavioral health, public health, um, and infrastructure across the department. And then finally, um, the new enterprise fund had uh, an increase of just uh, over 17 FTE in terms of net uh, changes in personnel. Um, Next slide. So this is our uh, uh, expenditures by category. Uh, this too uh, hasn't changed uh, significantly. Uh, what I will point out is 41, the $41 uh, million in ARPA spending is uh, somewhat evenly split between contractual services and personnel. So we um, have $20 million of that ARPA funding in contracts and uh, just under $19 million in personnel. And so um, the remaining uh, expenditures in uh, contract services are mostly in behavioral health, as they have been, you know, sort of consistently uh, throughout the years. And then, of course, it, the largest portion of personnel is uh, supporting our community health center. So next slide, please. All right, so looks like it's back to me. All right, so I feel like I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about um, the COVID response and really look at it specific to a department-wide effort. Um, you know, we are still in a pandemic and we're continuing to respond. Um, and I just wanna highlight and just take a minute to kind of recognize all of the health department because this was a time where folks had to 
dig deep, but um, I'm proud to say that I get the honor of supporting the health department and, and supporting folks who live out the values and the commitment to what we step up to do every day. And literally um, every division team um, in the health department um, has continued to play a key role in um, responding to the pandemic. Um, I will say, I think this November it will be that I've been in this role, you know, for about two years. Um, and when I stepped into this role, uh, we were heavily relying on the health officer and public health. Um, but we had the opportunity to look at how do we step forward as a health department, being able to uh, unite across expertise, values, commitment, um, resources, and that's what we were able to do. And so, you know, and I also have to say that ICS, the Health Community Health Center, they were front and center in, in, in the pandemic along with Corrections Health. And so, um, I have a couple slides that will kind of call out some of the specific work between um, the health center and primary care and their vaccination efforts, correction health, um, and their efforts to ensure that those in custody's uh, health and wellness were being supported and protected. Um, again, want to thank public health and the health officer for the ongoing policy direction. Want to um, recognize behavioral health and how they continue to be flexible and nimble and working to be creative and innovative in working to um, address and support mental health needs, especially in ever-changing climate and, and environment. Um, HR continued to do their day-to-day -day work, but also working to look at how are we um, supporting the, the staffing needs specific to our response. Um, Wendy's shop in finance and business, they saw an increase in all that they do from just the financial elements to contracts and procurement. Um, so want to thank and recognize that team and then organizational development for just continuing to support us just around change management and really working to make sure that we kept um, the through lines of what it means uh, to lead with race in all that we do. And so that said, I just want to say that I'm proud of the commitment that all of our health department employees have brought and continue to bring um, to the work that we do. Um, I'm proud of what we were able to accomplish together, especially in the very difficult times and all that we did, even going back to thinking about the time of unrest and injustice in our system, um, the stress and the grief of uh, COVID and the surges. Um, we saw and continue to see deep personal impacts of isolation and, and we have a lot of heavy lifting to do as we continue to move forward, but our health department staff um, so those on the front lines all the way to the leaders continue to you know be here and be ready and and, and prioritize um, what it means to be a public servant so i want to say thank you to you know all staff and employees um, in the health department next slide so more specifically, this is a snapshot of what our health department COVID response and recovery structure looked like. So again, you know, besides just the role of what the health officer and um, the public health director and division um, brought forward in tandem with the county uh, emergency management, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, demonstrate what we could bring to the table as the health department. And so we stood up the COVID response and recovery structure, again, where we had all represent, representation from all divisions. Um, and the goal was to look at how do we eliminate siloing? How do we uh, improve communication, teamwork, and problem solving just so we continue to be flexible, agile, and nimble? But again, being able to work in real time and really, again, being able to leverage um, our resources and expertise across the department. The new innovative structure uh, brought together department leadership um, uh, at a regular cadence, and we continue to meet at a regular cadence. Um, we work to look at how do we uh, problem solve from a collective and multi multidisciplinary framework, and, and, and then more importantly, how do we continue to learn from um, our collective experience because we continue to be in the response or in the pandemic. And um, there are so many new things that we're having to navigate when we think about, you know, um, the, the, the uh, wildfires. We think about, you know, severe winter weather, 
on top of just elements specific to also um, the COVID-19 response. And so um, I feel like we have put our foot best foot forward and we continue to um, step up to the challenge. Um, next slide. Um, and so then here's just another snapshot of just what the work looked like from a department wide effort. And so when you, you see that we have it broken out by three categories, isolation and quarantine, testing and vaccinations. And so this effort was multi pronged and robust. Um, and so in conjunction with DCHS, we had about 5000 families uh, supported with housing supports, including rent and groceries. While in quarantine, um, we had over 53,000 COVID tests administered, over um, 12,000 tests distributed to community based organizations, and almost 118,000 vaccine doses given. And so, this is just a quick snapshot. Um, and as we have the presentations to come, you'll hear more depth and detail about this work. Next slide. And so then this is our vaccine equity plan. And so when it came to our vaccine efforts, the health department, we continue to lead with race, uh, really wanting to model what it means to live out that value. Um, so we provided culturally specific communications and outreach to targeted communities, and I should say BIPOC communities. Um, we work to empower our community-based organizations by expanding their, by providing resource to expand their capacity uh, within their various roles and scopes. Uh, we placed vaccine clinics in the communities, employed mobile vaccine clinics. We implemented highly successful vaccine incentive program, and we worked to share power by empowering communities experiencing inequities in decision making. Next slide. And so this is just a breakdown of what the divisions and teams um, look like across our community um, with special attention to the reach, um, our community partners and corrections health. So you'll see in uh, integrated clinical services or also known as our community health center, there's 35,000, almost 36,000 doses given. Public health in um, our uh, CD, um, chronic disease area, there's 50 to almost 53,000 doses in the REACH program, 23 doses. And then you'll see the comparison with community partners of the 5,000 and then corrections health uh, with the almost 2,000 doses given. Next slide. And then this is, again, just another breakdown by what it looks like across race and ethnicity. And so when we look at um, the BIPOC across the continuum, so if you total, you know, um, the percentage by um, Hispanic, Latinx, and then by um, Asian, Black, uh, American Indian, Alaskan Native, and then Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, and then other, which um, also is known as multiracial, you'll see that that actually um, outweighs um, the white population, which again is in line with our strategy of uh, leading um, with racial equity. Next slide. Are we doing the next slide? That it is that, that the first one was public health and the second one. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, these just all start to look alike. Um, and so again, <laughs> the same um, thing with you'll see that you know those that were served uh, just consistently throughout all of the years. Yes. <laughs> all right. Let's go to the next slide. Um, that can be so. Um, in this section. We've included all of the divisions, but we're only going to focus on uh, those in bold at the top um, because you'll be hearing from all the other divisions in more depth coming up. So we're going to just race through those. Um, so uh, I think, uh, Ebony, you're first and then I'll go second. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm first and then you're next. Um, so this is our budget by division and the COVID um funding is separated out um into its own uh section and so the the um uh the distribution of resources across the divisions really hasn't changed all that much um but it does uh, give you a sense of size and scope and public health is certainly um 
receiving most of that COVID funding. And so the, the size and scope of responsibility for the public health division in relationship to the rest of the department has certainly uh, grown in the last couple of years. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Ebony, for the first one. Next slide, please. All right, so this is specific to um, my office. And so um, just wanna highlight that you'll see for fiscal year 22 in the adopted budget, um, there's about 4.9 million uh, that's allocated to the director's office uh, through general fund. And then for the proposed budget of uh, fiscal year 2023, um, it's 5.2. And um, you know the, the increase is specific to the new investments with which we're um, highly appreciative for. And so um, in detail, those investments, the new investments include um, about 264,000 for a second deputy director, which is you know 1.0 FTE, and then you'll see the correlating program offer there. Um, and you know again, that will help continue to support some of the operational administrative efforts opposite of Windy, in addition to providing additional leadership capacity. Um, then we have 300,000 um, allocated for the Beacon Project, also known as the Behavioral Health Emergency Coordinated Network. And this is going to be basically seed money to um, help uh, the Multnomah County, specifically the Health Department and Behavioral Health Division, step into a more um, uh, stronger leadership role. And then we have a 155,000 um, and change uh, to support what we call the COOP coordinator, also known as the Continuity of Operations Coordinator, to continue to help assure a department-wide response in our emergency management efforts. Um, and then I also want to highlight, um, and it's not specifically on that slide, that we um, will be moving the equity manager um, into the director's office in fiscal year 2023, so that's another change. And that's going to kind of allow uh, alignment and continuity for health departments so that we can match the other departments across the county and just assure that we really are um, bringing forward our equity efforts um, at the highest levels. Um, and then we are working and continuing to kind of work through some final processes with uh, class comp around, uh, which was formerly known as the EAE, um, Epi Analytics Evaluation Division. Uh, we'll be reconfiguring that shortly um, in FY23, and the new title will be quality the quality program. Um, so more to come there. Um, so just wanna highlight those two changes. Um, and I think I pass it back to Wendy. So in, uh, in my division in finance and business management, uh, the division grew by uh, just over $2 million. Uh, half of that is uh, one time only funding uh, for four uh, IT personnel. So they'll be um, limited duration personnel uh, working on health department specific um, IT projects, but they will be housed uh, with IT and working under their supervision and also um, one time only funding to support uh, uh, finance staff to help the behavioral health division um, uh, convert or clean up their billing system evolve uh, so that they can utilize it more effectively in billing uh, behavioral health services. And so um, those positions are all uh, one time only in nature. Next slide, please. So in human resources, um, the, the uh, chair has kindly uh, recognized uh, the critical services that they are providing and the tremendous pressure that the pandemic has placed on uh, human resources. So they, as Mary Lisa mentioned, they are critical to implementing many of our WESP initiatives and to continue uh, to address the pandemic uh, staffing needs um, and response and recovery needs uh, for fiscal year 23, but also to uh, continue to be able to fill critical and increasingly difficult positions across our organization um, so that we can continue to respond to the needs of the community. 
Um, their capacity has really been stretched um, since the start of the pandemic. I mean, having to uh, launch recruitments for so many limited duration positions that we needed immediately um, took a toll. Um, and this additional increase of four uh, health recruiters will double their capacity. They'll uh, go from having four to eight recruiters. And then in class comp, uh, this will increase, this will double their class comp numbers from one person to two people. Um, and just in terms of context, they have uh, limited duration staff working um, there now. So this will just allow them to uh, continue to keep those uh, limited duration pers personnel as ongoing personnel. Uh, next slide. I thought it was important to provide a little more context in terms of um, the volume of work. And so this is a graph uh, over the last uh, four calendar years that includes um, all types of hires. So limited duration, regular, on-call, and temporary personnel. Um, it doesn't, however, include temporary contract employees uh, from agencies like Robert Haft, but those um, personnel, our team, our HR team also has to do some support of those personnel as well, but this doesn't include those folks. Um, but it gives you an idea of the volume that has uh, increased over the last few years. Um, and what this doesn't really reflect is, this is the number of hires. What it doesn't reflect is the actual number of recruitments because we're experiencing um, considerable challenges in filling positions. Um, and uh, and so many times uh, we have to open up a recruitment uh, two or three times before we are actually able to make a successful hire. And so that's just both a function of, you know, national shortages in certain healthcare professions, but also we've just had difficulty attracting people um, across our organization in a number of uh, classifications that aren't healthcare specific. Um, and then we're also experiencing uh, the great resignation like everyone else. And so we are, um, we're getting to a point where we're nearly losing as many people as we're hiring. And so the, the ongoing work of recruitment and retention that isn't just driven by the pandemic, it's also driven by a lot of the results of the pandemic and work uh, employee shortages. So uh, next slide. This just gives you a point in time snapshot of the hiring activity um, this spring. And so uh, we had 39 active recruitments at a point in at a, uh, at a point in March, I believe when this data was run and 204, the little circle at the bottom of the, of the graph or of the uh, slide will tell you um, what type of recruitments these were. And so 204 of the 329 were for regular status um, FTE. And then uh, the other circle uh, breaks it out by division. And so you'll see that most of the recruitments were for ICS, um, but this really across the board for all the divisions, they're recruiting about 20% of their workforce. So this translates for public health, behavioral health, and ICS, about 20% of their workforce is in recruitment. So that's pretty sizable. Next slide, please. In organizational development, um, the significant change here and that is reflected in a slight decline is the movement of the equity manager from organizational development to the director's office. And then I think you can skip through the next slides. Can I Behavioral. just? Yeah. And I just want to, you know, while we're kind of uh, on HR and organizational development, I also want to just highlight that, you know, we currently are working with a consultant in HR to um, look at um, our processes and infrastructure in the areas of HR and organizational development to kind of uh, make some additional recommendations around um, how do we gain um, eff efficiencies and recommendations around assuring. Um, we have uh, the best kind of um, strategy laid out for how we do our business. And so currently um, those elements are being evaluated 
And so those um, the results will continue to impact some of the work that we do in the first quarter of um, the next fiscal year. So there may be some shifts and changes potentially um, early fiscal year between HR and OD, so more to come. So you'll hear from behavioral health next week. So we can skip that slide. Corrections health, you maybe are not gonna hear from today. I don't know. Um, next slide. Uh, uh, health officer as well. We'll go next week with public health. You can move to the next slide, please. Um, and ICS is next week also. Next slide and public health. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So here uh, as well, we've included everything that is new uh, backfill and restored program offers with general fund. We've included everything here so that you have it all in one place, but we're really only going to talk about um, we've we've talked about all of the infrastructure new and um, new and uh, and our backfilled and one time only position. So you can go to the next slide. And this is just the total of all of those changes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these are the one time only um, additions. And so you'll hear more from uh, public health or the health officer and uh, the community health center about their one time only additions. Next slide, please. And then uh, the same is true for the um, COVID-19 uh, program offers, we've included all of them here. And I just wanna to touch on a couple of them that are related uh, to infrastructure. So if you could go to the next slide, please, I believe they're on there. And so um, in the support area, um, there was an inc there was a, is COVID program offer for $1.4 million. And most of that is for educational materials uh, related to our WESP in organizational development, and then a uh, COVID response project manager in the director's office, and then four um, limited duration uh, positions in accounting and contracting, um, doing work uh, 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 directly related to the pandemic financial reporting and accounting. So um, that is included in, uh, in my division. Uh, and then also on this slide, I'm having a hard time seeing if this is the right slide or not. Um, but there is, uh, I want to point out that there's a, been a withdrawal of the nurse family partnership uh, COVID um, request. Um, they ended up finding uh, other funding um, that's available for fiscal year 23. So they no longer needed uh, the COVID um, funding that they had requested. And then um, we also are not requesting uh, client assistance this year. So you'll see a, you know, a, a million to there um, in the negative. And we've really faced a lot of challenges distributing client assistance this year. And so, uh, and we're just, we're just now getting started on distributing uh, that assistance. And so for next fiscal year, if we, um, you know, if we deem that or, or determine that client assistance in the form of gift cards is still a strategy that we want to employ, we'll work with the chair's office and the board to, to determine if there's additional underspending in public health that we want to redirect for client assistance. But we didn't want to tie up uh, funding uh, next year dedicated to this, given the challenges that we've had this year and actually um, dispensing it. So. Uh, next slide. I think that's the end of that. Uh, next slide, please. Next. All right. So um, I think two two slides left, maybe. Um, so just briefly, want to kind of highlight some um, policy and state federal impacts to continue to be mindful of and to watch. And so. Um, in the public health area, there's House Bill 4052, which recognizes racism as a public health crisis and directs the Oregon Health Authority to fund culturally and linguistically specific programs to address 
health inequities for the BIPOC communities. And then in Senate Bill uh, 1554, um, the COVID after action public health report, which requires the Oregon Health Authority to contract with a neutral party to study and report on the state state's public health response to COVID-19 pandemic. Um, with the first report being due November 15th of 2022 and uh, subsequent reports due April 1st of 2023 and September 1st of 2023. In behavioral health, House Bill 5202, there's uh, 132 million earmarked in uh, provider retention money that will benefit many of our contracted providers. Then there's uh, 42 million uh, that will result in a 30% increase in behavioral health rates. And then additional funding for behavioral health housing approximately 9.7 million. Um, and then other health care, there's House Bill 4035, uh, the Oregon Health Plan Redeterminations, which stabilizes health coverage by phasing in redeterminations and adjusting timelines. And um, with the Medicaid uh, 1115 waivers, uh, jails will still be required to provide pay statutory required services. Um, the Oregon Health Plan benefits will lift up services beyond that um, floor. And then the last slide um, is just a snapshot of upcoming presentations. And so we have Corrections Health, um, and then we have the Joint Office of Homeless Services with Behavioral Health on May 21st. And then we have Behavioral Health May 31st. We have Public Health and Health Officer on May 31st. And then we have our Health Community Health Center Integrated Clinical Services also on May 31st. And so we'll determine kind of what when we'll get corrections health rescheduled. But with that, that's the end of our slides. And so ready for questions, Chair? Great, thank you. Um, commissioners, we will, uh, and knowing that this schedule that we see up, what says up next, may be subject to change. Um, so we'll uh, get started with some questions and comments, and we are going to start this time with uh, Commissioner. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you so much, everyone, for the really thorough presentation, just like with the library. Um, it, I think it's so good for us to be able to get this sense of all of the work that's happening at the at the department, um, especially through the director's office and, and just the, the big department wide um, priorities and, and work that's happening. Um, and I really appreciated um, hearing about the different um, investments, um, both in the equity work that's happening at the health department. Um, you know, I was glad to hear that the health um, health department equity director is moving into the director's office. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and also just appreciated the slides around the um, cross division work that's been happening and the cross departmental work that's been happening um, at the health department. I think in the health department sets at such a critical intersection of the work that we do at the county. And so making sure that um, you are all in good communication with the other departments, as well as making sure that within the you know department itself, the divisions are are having those conversations. Um, I know you focused mostly on COVID, but that was really good. Um, I did have one question, maybe a couple questions. Um, one was um, talking about the the um, thirty nine LDA positions that were um, moved into full time positions. Could you give me some examples of those job categories or the the type of jobs that those that were moved over? I could see if our HR. You can follow up with that. Too. Okay. Yeah. I was looking to see if our HR director. I would say that this mostly um, public health, potentially maybe, probably mostly. Yeah, well, they were primarily in, in public health, but in terms of job classifications, I think is the question. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, that's fine. That's no problem. Um, and then, um, I would just really be interested in hearing more about the, and again, this can be offline and we can have this conversation Ebony, about the culturally specific behavioral health investments. I know, you know, prior to COVID, we were starting to have those really great community conversations around mental health with the black community and just wanted to see how those, um, how those conversations are still going and how that's parlaying into like the work that we're doing and the partnerships we're having. So we just to put that on the, on our agenda for our next meeting. Okay. And that is on, that will be covered at the behavioral Oh, okay. So okay. This is the health overview, right. and then we'll take each of the divisions separately next week. So we'll have more time to talk about that during behavioral Perfect. health. First. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you guys so much. Thanks for highlighting that. Definitely. Yes. Thanks. Thanks your segment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all for the presentation. 
uh, and maybe these questions can be answered in subsequent meetings, but I uh, appreciate the million dollars for the school based mental health expansion. And obviously we know that our youth are uh, really struggling in our schools. So I'd like to learn a little bit more uh, about what that entails. Uh, and then also maybe a little bit more about the transit based behavioral health planning, which is really exciting and uh, again would like and, and maybe we'll get more um, from that as well. Uh, and then also the Medicaid waiver. I don't know like where, where are we at on that? Are we, are we getting close closer to getting reimbursed um, for people that are in our corrections? No, we're not. No, no. I, I, what I'll just briefly say is that I know that the state has submitted their application and now they're just in that process where they're having meetings um, with CMS in, and they're kind of going through that process of um, kind of clarifying the request. And so um, if I'm tracking correctly, but I can follow up with government relations, I think we'll know more um, later this fall or winter. Great. Thank you. Mr. Myron. Thank you. Um, I want, I can't see from here whether, um, <clears throat> whether CJ and Rhonda are still there, but I just going way back to their presentation. Um, uh, the, the real depth of understanding that they bring to their work at the CBAC and, um, the B and the, uh, health department in general was really, uh, so impressive and is is so important and so i just wanted to express my gratitude to them and to the entire cbac for the work that they're doing on this really 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 complicated budget um and to maria for for your work on equity across the spectrum of the health department as well and then um i i just want to express appreciation for director clark and I mean, you've had a whirlwind trajectory into leadership and have risen to the occasion and have been on the front lines of caring for our community through this, the pandemic, multiple public health crises, and you are a rock star. And I have worked alongside you in so many different contexts and senior leadership up close in the community and you hold so much weight on your shoulders and do it with such grace and strength and authenticity. And I just want to thank you personally, because it's been a lot. Um, uh, and for the entire health department team as well, um, especially the past couple of years. Um, in terms of adding capacity to the health department leadership, uh, I maybe you know and and this could be offline um i know there's the program offer is in the proposed budget to fund another you know a deputy director position and clearly there's enough work for multiple deputy directors but right now i mean there there seems to have been a lot of turnover and turmoil in that office i mean in that role and um like we just we don't I don't think we have a deputy. Do we have a deputy director now? Because I think someone was there for like two months finally and but then they left. Um, and so I don't know if this points to some bigger issues as to what the what that what is the reason for that? And will another position get at that um, to add the capacity we need or are there some other considerations? So I'd love to have a conversation about that and understand that better. I think you might be confused about the role. So, um, Ebony, can you talk a little bit yeah. about what this? Yeah, so Wendy Lear currently is our current deputy director for health department. Thank you, Wendy. And so, um, oh, okay. Wendy, um, you know, Jesse. Um, outside okay. of her kind of, you know, um, department wide um, efforts, she also then leads the um, business finance. And so, this is expanding to a second deputy to kind of lead um, the opposite operational elements specific to HR, our emergency management response, our um, quality and data governance, um, IT, um, awesome. and, and I'm sure there's a couple other pieces, but I should highlight that um, we have a, a few leaders from deputies to directors across the department in interim roles. So 
in behavioral health. We have an interim uh, behavioral health director that we're currently working to recruit for permanent. And then we do have a vacancy in our um, deputy behavioral health role that we'll have to start to recruit for. So, so you know, um, there's yeah. some work to be done. Thank you. That, um, no, it, yeah, I, I was thinking of different, different roles. So that makes total sense. And in some of those other director and deputy director roles across the divisions, um, uh, I think there are some challenges there too to to kind of just look at more holistically. But thank you for that clarification. Um, and then, in turn, you know, a lot of my questions will, I can save for the individual divisions. Um, obviously, youth mental health, um, huge. A uh, huge need and heard amazing feedback at the youth mental health forum that I hosted last weekend and, um. And both the early childhood and school based mental health interventions kind of understanding how those all intersect. And the alignment and coordination among departments, which, um. You know, seems to be starting more to happen, which is great. And hope we this built on and then. We'll have questions about beacon, of course, medical examiner, um, future generations collaborative, the FQHC right. fund, mm -hmm. and that's and then the dentists and some nurses and ICS. But you, Commissioner Myron, can you hear me? I if can. You, yeah. This is this. If you have questions about the things that Ebony talked about that are in her department, such as beacon, um, now is the time to ask them. Okay. Or okay. at least write it. This the division specific. Issues like those around um, the dentists and nurses and and mental health; those should go during the specific division briefings okay. which come next week. But if you have things that Ebony talked about, she like Beacon, which is in her department under her leadership, she can talk about that now. Okay, that would be great. I mean, all of these things were raised today, so it's hard to know where where to fit them in. But that sounds great. Um, Beacon. Uh, Obviously, been working on that for the past couple of years. It sounds like there's, you know, I just saw the MOU, um, and so I'll, I just what the three, the three hundred thousand dollars is, you know, and I see that it's going to be added capacity for you because um, you'll be sort of leading. Um, but there's been a lot of tension and stuff around Beacon. Hopefully, will the three hundred thousand be going just to kind of getting the governance structure together or what um, was that yeah so um i will say that um what's clear that we've recognized as well as you know the partners <laughs> at the table of beacon is that um the county as the local mental health authority you know we play a key role in working to move this project forward um, as we think about kind of the system need that this project is to fill when we think about kind of our crisis um, services. And so the 300,000, yes, will provide some additional support for myself and behavioral health with a project manager and then um, potentially um, some contracted consulting work. And so it's just a way to kind of help continue to get us organized and continue to assure that the project move forward while continuing to leverage the current project management efforts with, uh, I believe, Lowe's Loans Consulting. Um, and as we kind of launch into this next phase, uh, we're kind of at a critical juncture of then looking at, yeah, how do we move forward um, in terms of um, some of the efforts between um, governance, uh, the core team, and the design yeah. team. And so um, more to come. That's that's great um yeah it's been interesting um and then is the was the medical examiner i saw the medical examiner and vehicle is that in public health or is that in the director's office i believe that's in the health officers um okay i, I just someone mentioned it but that's then i will go there future generations collaborative is that in public health? public health yes okay thank you um these are ones I just wrote down as they were brought up here, so not sure. And FQHC fund ICS. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I think that's that's all my questions for here. Um, but thank you so much to you and Wendy and everyone on your team. Thank you. Mr. Jaipal. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, Benny, Maria, Lisa, Wendy, such again, such a great overview of the work that the department does, all of the work that the department does. I too appreciated very much the alignment pieces that you talked about, Ebony, both the cross departmental, across the county, the interdepartmental, across the divisions. Um, so important. And then also appreciated your highlighting the fact that, yes, public health has been out front in many ways, particularly, you know, especially earlier, early on. Um, but that every division has played this critical, critical role. And uh, I, I think we can't highlight that enough. So I appreciate that a lot. I think the only, um, I'll have questions later on, obviously. One sort of, I guess, smallish question. Um, in terms of funding for capital projects for ICS, and I think this fits here, um, that comes out of general fund. And then is it is it sort of, reimbursed through internal service rates or how does how does funding for capital projects for ICS work now that we have an enterprise fund and we're you know kind of distinguishing those those streams the the general fund will reside in the health department um, budget and so it'll be in the director's office um, budget and then uh, facilities will be the one accessing that that funding and so they will you know, spend it down, or if there's, you know, if they don't spend it all down, they will be the ones directing how much is used and for what services. So um, I don't, you know, I think they will just direct charge against that fund for the capital work. I think I understand what you're, um, what you mean, Commissioner. I think it's, um, it's a choice of the board. It, it won't be, they, there are several um, capital investments that um, our clinics are going to be making in this upcoming year and so it was a, it was a, a, a decision that some would be paid for from county general fund and some would be paid for through um, fqhc uh, funds that they have in, in ics so um, when they come forward we can have more of a conversation okay. about yeah. how those decisions were made but it's it, that i mean it's ultimately our our decision yeah that, that that's exactly the question was whether there's a there's sort of a policy about about how we fund capital expenditures and whether the clinics end up sort of paying, you know, paying for that in some way. But I, I yeah, no, and it's been yeah. a, it's this has been something that we've talked about since the beginning of time with the health clinic. So we'll, yeah, we have we can have more conversation with them when they're okay. There. Great. Um, let me just see if I have any other little questions. Here. Oh, I'm just curious about the client assistance funds and the challenge. That client assistance is that the the gift cards that we did with vac with the vaccine program. No, um, but but that was part of what delayed us distributing client assistance. So in in uh, last fiscal year, we uh, there were two efforts. One was client assistance where we uh, distributed. It was primarily for WIC clients, but also for behavioral health clients and maternal child and family health clients. We distributed. Um, uh, gift visa gift cards to clients participating in those programs that were high need. And then we also did um, some uh, restaurant relief funding um, as well in the first year. So la last year, this year, we also asked for client assistance funding and that's uh, just uh, gift cards for clients participating in some of our uh, programs. It, it will be WIC again, maternal child and family health, some select uh, client programs within integrated clinical services, and some behavioral health clients also. And so that will be a, a gift a gift card that's uh, strictly for clients in those programs. Uh, but it was significantly delayed because the same staff doing that work we're doing the in vaccine incentive gift cards. So we had to wait till that was over before we could start uh, the client assistance uh, gift cards. So. Okay, so, so it was a timing challenge. It wasn't a challenge, you know, it's it, not necessarily a challenge that would be ongoing. Right, it was a timing challenge and a staff capacity challenge. And then the county was also renewing their their contract with B of A, so we couldn't get gift cards for a while. Um, so now, uh, so it wouldn't necessarily be a challenge um, in the coming year, but there's also been new guidance in terms of what's an eligible expense. And so we also have to navigate that. 
uh, differently than we did in the first year of the pandemic. So, okay, thank you. And then uh, one follow up on Beacon, um, Ebony. So we're, you know, three hundred thousand is going to go to your your sort of central capacity, some consulting. What is the budget for the effort overall? And maybe you, you can get back to me on that. Okay. Yep. Well, I think that's part of what we're going to spend the three hundred dollars to figure out. Three hundred thousand dollars is to is to do the planning for the staging of to come forward with the plan for the staging of because of the program because depending on who you talk to. It's either one thing, five things, or twenty-five things. So having some um, getting some clarity about which are going to be the first aspects of it, the second tier, third tier, kind of like we've done with mm -hmm. the a phased approach, right? But but is the, the, I'm talking about the planning budget, not the budget for the thing itself. Like so, so is the three hundred the planning budget for the full year, or it, is there additional? I mean. More just how the chair kind of highlighted is that it will initially kind of give us some some money to kind of start to understand what we're going to need. So the thing is, there's loans consulting. Um, uh, the city of Portland holds that contract, and so so right now they have funding to provide a level of project management. And so what we're having to what we'll have to figure out is kind of um, what we're going to need moving forward as we start to more fully step into this role. Um, and kind of the collaboration between loans and the county. So um, my assumption is that we will, there will be an additional ask. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is 1210. Mike, would you like to get started with uh, the corrections health? All right, come on down. We got 10 minutes. You can get through all 17 slides in 10 minutes. I know you can. <laughs> Oh, I didn't have my glasses on. It's only 1209. You've got plenty of time. And actually, I'm totally joking. I don't want you guys to feel rushed at all. You don't have to get through all the slides right now. I just want you to have the opportunity to get started, then we'll come back next week. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. This is important, and I don't want to be facetious when I should. Good morning or afternoon. All right, here we are. <laughs> Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Michael Biero. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the interim director for Corrections Health. Uh, thank you, Chair Kafuri, commissioners, for giving us this opportunity to present our budget. Uh, presenting with me today, are Rachel Lee and Dr. Michael Seal. And, um, <laughs> excuse me, we want to set a clear um, tone for our presentation as you go through each section that it has been very intentionally done uh, with equity embedded within each and every decision we've made along the way. Um, I think as I said before, and I'll state again, as the Mandalorians in Star Wars say, and as these for us in Corrections Health, this is the way. Um, next slide, please. So this is um, our agenda. I'm not going to detail all of it, but uh, you will see that we'll be highlighting important information uh, about the work that we intend to undertake at this next fiscal year. Next slide, please. Um, it's important for us in Corrections Health to acknowledge the historical harm done to the BIPOC community by the criminal uh, legal system that we work within. Our division has worked hard over the years to focus on client-centered care using best evidence-based practice which has led us to uh, uh, led our ability to be able to tackle SUD issues in our population in effective ways. Some of the partners that we have worked um, with and continue to work with to tackle SUD include the Harbor Clinic at OHSU, Recovery Works Northwest, the HIV Clinic, Blackburn, among, among many others. We have partnered with community partners and have maintained, and even in these people, um, in custody on treatment and continue building our networks to ensure uh, follow up um, appointments are met well past incarceration. We have had a clear focus on our COVID efforts, some of which will be detailed in a later slide. But what's clear is the positive impact, even through multiple outbreaks. We have been intentional in our efforts to promote health, reduce vaccine hesitancy, 
and provide education based on scientific evidence and using staff that are representative of our BIPOC population that we serve as well. We have worked with the Department of Community Justice and OHSU to follow up the critical completion of vaccine doses for many of our adults released from custody to ensure that we are being um, responsible in keeping our community safe. Our division continues to change. As our division continues to change and adapt to better serve our vulnerable population, we have a clear focus on building an infrastructure that allows us to accomplish our goals, including the additions of internal quality management, infection control, as well as lab services. Uh, next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, Corrections Health as a division plans to spend this next fiscal year working to increase diversity and equity in our workforce with a continued collaboration between Health HR local schools, and our leadership team. Throughout the pandemic, Corrections Health has experienced difficulty similar to other divisions and the community at large in recruiting staff as well as retaining staff. Some of the details will also be discussed in a later slide. Now, even through the uncertainty and competitiveness in the employment market, uh, we as Corrections Health remain dedicated to ensure that we hire staff that is reflective of the people that we serve. There are several approaches we will be undertaking, including but not limited to working with the unions, like ONA, for example, to get the requirements for nurses changed, so that we will allow us to hire a more diverse workforce directly from the local community colleges, which is something we've not been able to do in the past. Uh, Corrections Health has also received support from our department director, thank you, Ebony, um, including a much needed resource for um, adding a equity manager for our division. Slide. So this next year, Corrections Health, uh, we are focused on our continued efforts to reduce recidivism, and our budget priorities are geared, geared towards realizing that goal. As you will see in this slide, we really wanted to provide a visual into the population, into our population, and the incredible number of BIPOC pe uh, people in custody compared to what you see in the community. It is well known that there is an overrepresentation of BIPOC people in custody. It's quite stark that while making up just 6% of the population of Multnomah County, African American adults and youth in custody make up more than 20% of the jail and detention. Um, I will pass it to Rachel now. Thank you. Chair Kaforian, Commissioners. My name is Rachel Lee. I use. Oh. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the operations manager for Corrections Health. In fiscal year 22, Corrections Health consolidated positions dedicated to transition planning and care coordination under one supervisor and program called the Transition Services Program, or TSP. In fiscal year 2023, 20, uh, we will be adding five ARPA-funded positions to the Transition Services Program as a part of our regular budget. The TSP team is one of the ways in which Corrections Health shows our commitment to racial equity by reducing health disparities for justice-involved individuals and addressing the gross overrepresentation of BIPOC people and specifically Black people in Multnomah County jails. We have intentionally added bilingual Spanish speaking and culturally specific African-American positions so we can effectively serve those who have historically been negatively impacted by the criminal legal system in hopes of increasing access to health and behavioral health care and reducing recidivism. TSP is comp composed of three community health workers, two of which work on the Transition Services Unit as part of our collaboration effort with the Department of Community Justice to support people on supervision and address their health and other basic needs in hopes they do not return to custody. One eligibility specialist who, focus on the, who focuses on ensuring people in custody have act active health insurance when they release. Three transition planners who are also qualified mental health professionals and work to create complex care coordination plans for people in custody. And we are actively looking to hire a community health nurse and nurse practitioner to help increase our ability to provide, me provide medicated supported recovery services to people in custody and provide a bridge of support and care as we work to get patients connected to a community provider. As an example of the great work that has already been done, during fiscal year 22, the TSP team worked in partnership with public health and our clinical teams to run successful mass vaccination clinics inside the three detention facilities. Ensuring education materials were situationally and culturally appropriate 
and being intentional that the staff providing outreach and education reflected the clients themselves. The success of our outreach efforts can be measured by the fact that in the fall and winter of 2021, vaccination rates for BIPOC people in custody were reflective of their population rates, despite vaccine hesitancy within these populations in the community. Dr. Thiel will be discussing more specifics on the next slide. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Dr. Mike Seal. I'm, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the medical director for Corrections Health. Um, as we're all aware, in the community, COVID has become an ongoing challenge, and that challenge has not spared the jail. This year alone, we have addressed and are addressing the Omicron and subvariant surges. We are maintaining vigilance concerning the subvariants and future surges possibly to come. The slide gives you a general overview of our continuing efforts in that area. We continue to collaborate with Dr. Vines, Public Health, and the Sheriff's Office. Uh, some particular highlights would include ensuring access to vaccine throughout the entire pandemic and ensuring access to on-site antiviral medications uh, available at both facilities. We continue to screen incoming individuals to our facilities for symptoms at booking, and we continue to use rapid antigen testing. Those who test positive with the rapid antigen test for COVID are housed in the medical observation units or in cohorted housing to help us prevent the spread of infection in the facilities. We continue to provide culturally appropriate education, both as infections are identified and to promote the vaccinations as Rachel and Mike have alluded to. As of the end of April, 61% of the individuals in the adult facilities were fully vaccinated and 70% had received at least one dose of vaccine. Thanks to the availability of oral antiviral medications on site, we are able to treat those at risk for developing serious infections and complications from COVID. Overall, we have had a low number of COVID-related serious illnesses requiring hospitalization, and we have had no de COVID-related deaths, and we will continue our efforts. And I will turn that over to Mike. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Seal. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so as we... As I mentioned in a previous slide, our infrastructure in this next uh, fiscal year is built to allow us to better support our staff, um, as well as support, uh, serve the adults and youth in custody more effectively. And through the hiring of a quality manager, we will be able to track um, critical statistics in areas that we've never been able to do, um, thus providing us with uh, needed insight and being able to quantify the amazing work done by our staff. Uh, this was not from new funding, but rather within the health department budget. And furthermore, I wanted to thank you all um, for some funding that we received a few years ago that allowed us to migrate um, uh, from paper to electronic records at our youth facility at the Donald E. Long building. And through that, also, we've been able to ensure uh, that much needed dental services will be able to be provided at the facility for the very first time. It's a really big deal. Um, having an on-site nursing supervisor at the Donald E. Long um, as well for the first time has proved critical in the management of medical care provided um, for the youth, as well as partnership with the Department of Community Justice on site to provide excellent medical and mental health care um, for the youth um, in detention. Slide please. Actually, I think we should stop here. There's a nice break before you get into the budget detail and we'll um, okay. be in touch with you about next week's time. Yeah. You'll be first up. So you won't have to wait. <laughs> Thank you so Sounds much. Good. Thank Sorry you about so much. going over today. It's really, but it is really good to see you all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Everyone, very good presentations this morning. Always wonderful to hear about the good work. Um, Julie, we're still Julie. We're still in our budget meeting. If you want to take keep your voice down a little bit, that would be great. Your time was yesterday. We gave you plenty of time. Okay, that concludes our budget work sessions for today. Our next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, May 31st at 9 a.m. And we may have some changes to the calendar next week. Um, we will let you know as soon as we can figure those out. And I just wanna tell everyone, I appreciate you and the work that you're all doing and have a wonderful weekend. We are adjourned.